Episode 301, the 300th episode. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. It is the 300th episode, episode number 301. Since Woo! episode two, and uh, we are here in the trusty 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science. We are not live, broadcasting from the uh, Edwards Plateau, high atop the Edwards Plateau, amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed. Slightly less dusty. Uh, things are cooling off, as you can see. We got we got our hoodies on, long sleeves. Uh, we've been getting a little more rain, but yeah, it has been dusty this summer. Oh, you got you're going full hood. <laughs> <laughs> Feels great. <laughs> yeah. We've had cool nights. It's really awesome. And here we are, man. It feels like fall. 300 episodes. Wow. Yeah. Remember when we were, we were like, holy crap, we just published 10. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so we got, we got a bunch of stuff for this episode. It's, this is going to be old school style, so we're going to do the beginning at the beginning. Uh, but we also, I've got genius. some, I've got some stories. Yeah, we're just genius. Well, I've got some stories. We got emails and then we're also going to, you know, just kind of discuss where we are mentally with all this stuff that we talk about on the show. Like what's going on in our heads? Where are we at? What are our plans? Do we have any plans? Got plans are not plans. very snake bro. <laughs> <laughs> I have big plans, folks. <laughs> <laughs> They don't often come to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> When's the new board coming? That's the biggest plan you've got. They haven't contacted me. Oh, uh, September came and went. I guess I need to call them. Yeah. Yeah, we need I to get in touch it. With it was them. supposed to be September. Yeah. And September's gone. It's crazy. Man. <laughs> yeah, that was quick. Yeah. Well, we had Montana in the middle of it, you know. <clears throat> so They put me on a list. I'm supposed to be called. Just one of the many lists. Yeah. That you're on. Yeah. Never tell them about the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay, well, let's do space weather news. From spaceweather.com, what's up in space? Co-rotating interaction region. NOAA forecasters say that a co-rotating interaction region, or a CIR, could hit Earth later today. There is no up in space. <laughs> CIRs are shock-like transition zones between fast and slow-moving streams of solar wind. Think of them as mini CMEs. If this one arrives as predicted, Arctic sky watchers might witness an outbursts of light tonight. Oh. And then, of course, we have the Ring of Fire solar eclipse this weekend. And we'll, we can Saturday. talk. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, if you're in the Americas, you can witness a solar eclipse this weekend. The action begins on Saturday morning, October 14th, when the moon's shadow makes landfall in the Pacific Northwest corner of North America. It ends at sunset in Brazil. Uh, you must have eclipse glasses to view this event. Or or a welding. You can use a welding hood. <laughs> but I am not a doctor. Don't take my advice. <laughs> Uh, the eclipse is not total. The lunar disk will be too a little too small to block the entire sun. So even at maximum coverage, a ring of fire will be visible. It's very cool, yet at the same time, potentially dangerous to stare at. Here's something fun. Try looking down. Beneath a leafy tree, you might be surprised to find hundreds of crescent or ring-shaped sunbeams dappling the grass. Overlapping leaves create natural pinhole cameras. Each one casts an image of the crescent sun onto the ground beneath the canopy. You can also use your fingers to create sunbeams. Note, uh, and they're talking about a picture here, note this turkey. Uh, solar eclipse shadow play is safe and lots of fun. That's cool. Wow. Yeah. Also, there's a far side CME that targeted Mars. Earth just dodged another solar storm, but yesterday, SOHO coronagraphs observed a full halo CME emerging primarily over the sun's northeastern limb. This CME will not hit Earth. The blast site is on the far side of the sun. Instead of Earth, Mars should receive a nearly direct hit on October 14th, sparking UV auroras in that planet's magnetic umbrellas. The Perseverance what? Mars rover is seeing a sunspot that could be the source of this CME. <clears throat> what magnetic umbrella on Mars? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I guess probably it has a it little bit. It has a bit. tiny bit, yeah. 
And they're saying that the, uh, where is it? The Perseverance rover can see sunspots. Oh. <laughs> so they're looking up at the sun from Mars, and it's seeing a sunspot. That's interesting, especially considering those are supposed to be just out in the Arizona desert, right? They're not really on Mars. Yeah, I see a Mars lot. rover lo- watches solar eclipse. Yeah, on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Wait a minute>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Current conditions: solar wind speed three hundred six point four kilometers per second. The density is very low one point one zero protons per cubic centimeter. Current sunspot number is one hundred and twenty. The neutron count is minus two point five percent of the space age average. And the KP index is 1, which is quiet. 24-hour max is 1.33. Still quiet. Mm. And that is your Space Weather News for the week. Interesting. <sighs> Solar eclipse. Uh, yeah. We fired everybody in the marketing department, so we <laughs> hadn't really gotten this out in time. I mentioned it <laughs> a couple of episodes ago. We're but playing yeah. a show. Yeah. Uh, it's it, If anybody's in the area... And you want to go, it's uh, look up howlattheholler.com. Yeah. And I put the links for this in episode 298. I'll put it, or 299. I'll put them, I'll put them in, the, in this episode as well. We but go I mean, on it. We go I on mean, it, this episode uh, will probably get published after we do it. If Oh. Who knows? Crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it. No, I mean, like, the, the audio might get out there before, but. Okay. I don't know about the video. We'll see. Yeah, so we go on at 115. And then we play until 3.15. And are so. we supposed to give a presentation as well? Yeah. Well, we better look at that. <laughs> we, I know. I was we like. We need to go through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I don't know what time that's going to be. I guess we're just going to be hanging out there all day. Okay. Because I told him, like, well, if we're going to show slides, like, we're going to need to do it at night. Yeah. Yeah. So, but people will be camping there and uh, whatever. It's It's. Available to the public to buy tickets and go. Yeah, howlattheholler.com. The Propanator. It's the Propanator. TV. Yeah. Who donated the monitor in, yeah. in the cube years ago. <laughs> <laughs> he got uh, very upset when we mentioned him as the propane, propane guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> he sent us an email. <laughs> very uh, <laughs> sternly demanding that uh, he have a not be referred to as propane guy. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So yeah, so he's the propanator, which is, and now we just do this with everyone. Like that's why we have the customator as well. And if you're out there listening, bro, bro thanks. <laughs> yes. Gonna need you. Never call him the customs guy. <laughs> that's right. He's the pro- he's the customator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so I got a few stories, and I know, I've seen people talking about this in the Discord and in, in Twitter and everything, uh, but I wanted to dig into this a little bit. So, By the way, I just want to say one more thing about oh, yeah, the show. Yeah. Go ahead. It's not $50 Dynasty. Right. We are, uh, you know, it's, it's me and Russ, uh, but also uh, Dozer Dan yeah. of uh, Snake Bros Bumper Music, bass playing. Fame is going to be on the bass, and our buddy William's going to be playing guitar. We will be doing a few originals, but it's mostly cover songs. Yeah, that's right. And also, the Eclipse event for next year, the tickets for that are going on sale during the Eclipse event for this year. That's, oh, okay. That's what I figured out. It's, it, yeah, careful when you go to, if you if you buy a ticket the day of, <laughs> make sure it's 2023. 20, <laughs> Yeah, so Laura has been working on this with uh, the guys from Grimerica and our our team at Holocene, uh, the Holocene Group, which is the the team we put together to help put on these uh, events and these tours and everything. They've been working really hard on this. This is also going to be at this guy's property, right? Yes. The Propanator's property. Next year, the full eclipse. Uh, but this one's being put on by uh, all of us. Ben's going to be there. We'll be there. The Grimerica guys will be there and a whole bunch of people, so you guys can definitely sign up for that one. We'll be giving a presentation. Ben will be giving a presentation. We're having David Matheson there. He's going to give a presentation. There's going to be bands and music and DJs, and it's going to be awesome. 
were trying to do uh, an actual fifty dollar dynasty show at that one, right? Like plus a bunch of other bands, yeah, hopefully, yeah. So it's that's, gonna be that's gonna be uh, the event of the century. It's gonna be hard to get. I I think I don't know. Ty is Ty's booking the bands, but I'm like, man, there's gonna be a lot of competition for getting bands. Yeah, it's probably gonna be difficult, but we're gonna get some. Ty's I I trust Ty will pull some good bands. Yeah. Yeah, so that one will be going on sale, uh, like I said, on the 14th as well. So Saturday, the cool. day of the eclipse this year. Um, I'll try to put the I'll put the notes the the link for that in the show notes for this as well, so that you guys can start planning it out. Because I know a lot of people have said that they want to go. If we're throwing an event for the full eclipse next year, they want to go. So we'll put that up there. And I'm really excited because I for 20 years <laughs> I've had this gigantic German lighting truss. For like major oh, yeah. big stage and light <laughs> piled up at the back of my property, just yeah. thinking one day <laughs> I'm going to build a giant stage with this thing. <laughs> and it's just been back there rusting. And the propanator came over here and we were talking about moving, you know, he he's just setting up his property to do these events. Yeah. And he just hit me up out of the blue, just like, bro, you want to come play the eclipse? Yeah. And the more we got to talking, I was like, bro. I've got a lighting truss. <sighs> so he came over here with this giant trailer, and we spent the evening loading un- it up, unbolting the pieces of it and loading it up. I mean, just it's so much stuff. And uh, he took it home, and immediately, like the next day, he was sending me pictures of them painting it black. Nice. It looks awesome. And then they built, they put it all together. It's giant. They hung all these lights on. It looks the stage looks awesome. <laughs> so I'm just like, yes, <laughs> finally. <laughs> I knew I kept this thing for a reason. Now we need to find a use for those massive skyscraper glass windows. I know. I was telling him I got those too. It's like, hey, you could uh... a <laughs> stack of skyscraper glass back there. I do. Also been keeping for years, thinking one day, one day I'm gonna build a giant sky glass, something or other, out of this glass. It's like two thousand pounds of glass yeah. back there. And yeah, the pallets are just like falling apart, and it's, yeah, I'm just like. I'm going to eventually have to throw this away. We did use one as an excellent beer pong table. Oh man, they make a great beer it's pong. It's a perfect. Table. Beer Anybody pong. wants I mean, a beer pong table? Heavy, these things are ten and a half beautiful. Feet, <laughs> ten and a half feet long by two and a half feet wide. <laughs> beautiful, like sky blue reflective glass, double pane. Yeah, and you can you can light them from underneath. They're yeah. not they're not see through. They're for skyscrapers. They're they're like a mirror. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they're just awesome. So we had them. We had one set up in the yard, and it's just like, this is the best beer pong table <laughs> ever yeah, invented. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're so heavy. And I, one day I went out there, and I was just like, how hard will it be to actually throw this in the trash? Yeah, I know. It would be harder to throw so it in the trash. I broke one oh. <laughs> just to see. Because, <laughs> it's dude, there's so many of them. I'm like, I got to get rid of these at some point. Yeah. I, can't, I can't give them away. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was a lot of work to throw away one. <laughs> <laughs> Our best bet is going to be dig a hole, <laughs> Just bury them, put them in the hole. I'm at the top of the hill and, and cover rocks. it up. <laughs> yeah, but they're flat. You can yeah. dig lots of shallow holes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they're going to go to the dumpster if I can't give yeah. them away. So the other the other thing I want to would like to do at this, and now that we're putting on this event and there's going to be all these people and we're playing a show and giving presentations, I don't know. But, you know, we've talked with GMA, who's been on the show multiple times doing with the precision stuff and everything. We've talked to him about, like, let's set up this pendulum experiment. Yeah. And, like, have it legit. It needs to be in a protected, it can't be affected by the wind. Yeah. Right? Or any f- magnetic well, he's fields. Got an enclosed building in there, so we could, but yeah. Yeah, so it, it and then then and it, like the pendulum is easy, but GMA has to build the instruments it's, that can measure it cuz it's a it's it's not going to be something you can see. You, you have to measure the effect with instruments and then graph it out. Yeah, the pendulum, yeah, he would have to do that with the imaging cameras. Yeah, he's going to have to have imaging the, cameras and then a way to graph out the re- results. But the pendulum is not that easy. I mean, we were we, It's easy compared to the we were talking about this because you you're you know, the the bearing at the top has yeah. to be universal. Yep. 
It has to be a universal so, bearing. Like we have to use some kind of ball joint. We'd have to. We'll have to engineer. You something. just hang a plum from a string and swing it. <laughs> I know. I'm joking. No. Yeah, it's a faux called it pendulum. Be, you yeah. need it to be really heavy. Yeah. Right, so that it's 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 the the less effect of of any air resistance yep. or whatever. So you got to hang it from something really strong. It's going to be on a cable. Yeah, and you don't want the cable, like if you got a, you know, uh, a a clevis up there or whatever, that it it's easy to swing this way, but it doesn't really want to go that way. Right, you got to yeah. have some kind of universal yep. swivel ball joint or something. Yeah, it's grease. Mm-hmm. We were talking about it, you know. It's like, how high can we get this thing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. The long, the longer the cable and the heavier the weight, the the better yeah. results you get. The more accurate. And then I was like, well, we could have one just outside. That's not a, you know, that's just more like a piece of art that's on yeah. display. And then we were talking about, man, people are going to be drinking. They're yeah. going to be walking around at night and just <laughs> bang, <laughs> knocked over by some giant. Yeah, piece of hundred metal. <laughs> hundred pounds of steel just hits them in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we got to put a fence around it. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to, I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, you know, just would be cool. let's 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 try this. You know, uh, and that that means, and then to get actual real data from it, we're gonna have to set it up beforehand, and you know, and then get the data from it, normal data, right? Mm-hmm. And say, okay, here's what it looks like, and here's how you know. In other words, like let's get some. Control graphs, right? Which and, you can also do after the fact. Yeah, you can do it after the fact as well, yeah. yeah. But before and after would be best. Yeah. yeah. And then the other question, I guess I need to look into this again, is like how... Because these experiments were performed before, and I would like to know what they were using. Like, is this mm-hmm. effect so slight that a really heavy pendulum is not going to reflect it? Do you need one lighter, you know, a small one? Because it'll be greater, more greater affected. I don't know, or maybe a heavier one, heavier one is better because the effect itself is so slight that uh, the only way to measure it is to have one that that doesn't have as much noise in it, right? Yeah. I don't know, and so you need a big one, a heavy one. I don't know. I need to look into it. Yeah, again. that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, you go too far one way, and you may. Yeah, huh. yeah, that's interesting. To think yeah, because if it's going to be a gravitic effect, is it the pendulum being affected or the Earth? Because the Earth is the reason why the no one knows. goes in a circle. Yeah, yeah, no one if knows. You, if, like, remember we were talking about this. Like, if you just if you put the pendulum at the at the equator, it doesn't spin around. It doesn't right. go in a circle. If you yeah. put it at the pole, yeah, it. Uh, what? How does it work? I can't remember. If but you there put was... it at the pole, it just goes like this, right? It goes in a big <laughs> circle. If you put it at the equator, it's like a perfect back and forth, never spins. <laughs> Anywhere in between, it, it it does this thing. But yeah, the equator just... No, yeah, I know that's wrong. But yeah... I'm trying I, to remember what it was. It I, does something I, there, different at the pole than it does... Well, that's the thing, is people were saying that this effect implies that j- d- just the act of a of a, an eclipse actually is affecting gravity somehow, right? And so I don't know if it's... If it's just... If it's like Earth spin that's changing or if it's actually part of the motion of the pendulum that's changing that mm-hmm. doesn't have anything to do with the Earth spin. I can't remember. We're going to need to look into it again. Yeah. This was years ago when we were talking about it. The, the guy at the gas station in town saw me. I, I went to this random gas station I haven't been to in a while. And he's just like, are you guys still going to do that thing you were talking about? You're going to build some device <laughs> for, the, for the eclipse? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. That guy? Yeah, he used to work at the ice house. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure on the podcast y'all were saying you were going to build some contraption <laughs> on the eclipse. And I'm like, no, that wasn't us, bro. <laughs> you got the wrong podcaster. <laughs> what podcast? <laughs> and then when I was finally, I was like about to leave, I was like, oh, wait, you're right. <laughs> that was us. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, he reminded me of it. So then I called GMA, bro, we got to build this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we've been talking about it. GMA and I have been talking about it off and on for four years since we did those episodes okay. on this, you know, and I've been like, okay, so then now the eclipse is two years away, bro. Like, are we going to be able to do this? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. You know, but GMA, like. This guy says he doesn't have plans. <laughs> <laughs> you got big plans, too. That's a long term plan. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's let's start with this story. I I read a bunch of different 
more popular articles on this, trying to find a good one for the show. So I ended up picking EarthSky.org. Ah, website. Great website. Yeah, biggest solar superstorm yet glimpsed in ancient tree rings. This was published October eleventh, twenty twenty three. I think I did. Yeah, this, this is good. It's really cool. So scientists said on October 9th, 2023, that they have a new candidate for the biggest solar superstorm yet known. The evidence takes the form of radiocarbon or carbon-14 in ancient tree rings, which had been preserved in a riverbank in the French Alps. The scientists believe that for this much radiocarbon to show up in tree rings, an immense spike in radiocarbon must have occurred in Earth's upper atmosphere some 14,300 years ago. They believe the spike stemmed from a huge disturbance on the sun that rippled out across the solar system, a solar superstorm so powerful that we still see its effects thousands of years later. Solar storms aren't rare, but solar superstorms packing this much punch certainly are rare. If one were to strike Earth today, Earth's atmosphere would protect our human bodies from harm, but the superstorm would likely cause billions of dollars in damages to human technologies, in particular to our electrical grid and also to satellites in Earth's orbit. And I've seen in some other articles people were speculating that it would knock, it would kill all the satellites, and then the grid would be down for months, and if it's down for months, that means the end of civilization, right? Like Once it's down long enough and you can't transport food, you know, and you can't they're like all the power systems are completely gone. You can't rebuild them because you don't have any power anywhere, right? So it would it, it does seem like it might cause a civilizational collapse. Yeah, yeah, I can see that without cause... killing anything. Yeah, right. If if they're right about that, and that's not necessarily true because they don't actually know. And I I was reading about this in other places. They don't actually know how much gamma radiation an event like this would cause. And if it if it did cause a lot of gamma radiation, it's possible that. Everything facing the sun at the time that it happens gets, you know, irradiated. Like, you're going to die. It's like, it's so, who knows? But the scientists said the solar superstorm was 10 times stronger than the solar storm that caused the famous Carrington event. Before now, it was considered the most intense geomagnetic storm in recorded history, which sparked fires <laughs> at telegraph stations and spread auroras around the globe in the year 1859. The International Group of Scientists is warning of the importance of understanding such storms to protect our global communications and energy infrastructure for the future. And I'll just also point out that the other thing I've seen these these guys quoted as saying about the Carrington event was that the Carrington event was a big storm, but it's not big enough to leave a record that we could see in tree rings like they've they've got here. So they're like, this thing we're seeing from 14,000 years ago, was it was way stronger you know, the it just so happens to line up with uh, Meltwater Pulse 1A, also right. like 14,000 years yes. ago. Yes, and, I mean, come and on. the older Dryas. That's the older yeah. Dryas yeah. period, the, the period That's between the, the Balling and the Alarod, which are two like more yeah. warm er eras. Yeah. Wow, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, it lines up perfectly with it. Okay, so tree rings tell the story. The peer-reviewed journal, The Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society A, published these researchers' study on October 9th. The researchers analyzed preserved trees from along the banks of the Druze River in the French Alps. The trees were partially fossilized, and tiny slices of the tree rings showed an unprecedented spike in radiocarbon levels occurring precisely 14,300 years ago. And I mean, it's like exactly, it's crazy. you know, just counting yeah, the years. The tree ring, yeah. Yeah. Dendrochronology. Yeah. So there's a quote here. Finding such a collection of preserved trees was truly exceptional. By comparing the widths of the individual tree rings in multiple tree trunks, we then carefully pieced together the separate trees to create a longer timeline using a method called dendrochronology. This allowed us to discover invaluable information on past environmental changes and me measure radiocarbon over an uncharted period of solar activity. Another quote, radiocarbon is, consider is constantly being produced in the upper atmosphere through a chain of reactions initiated by cosmic rays. Recently, scientists have found that extreme solar events, including solar flares and coronal mass ejections, can also create short-term bursts of energetic particles that are preserved as huge spikes in radiocarbon production. So the, the uh, Meltwater Pulse 1A was between, it's a, it's a rapid post-glacial sea level rise that occurred between 13.5 and 14.7 thousand years ago so this is like near the very beginning of that 
yeah. the beginning of that pulse. 14-3, yep. right? Yes, and that's, yeah, 14-3. Okay, so, so how, they, yeah, this is like a big range, and that's a very yeah. specific date, which right. falls within this range. Yeah. That's crazy, dude. So how did the radiocarbon make its way into the trees? The scientist's paper explained, the radiocarbon produced is not only circulated through Earth's atmosphere and oceans, but is also absorbed by the biosphere and locked into the annual growth rings of trees. The team compared this spike to the chemical beryllium from ice cores in Greenland. So when I was reading the paper, they, they, they first, they, and also the, if you go find the paper, I can put links to this in the show notes. The paper is open. Uh, it's not behind a paywall. They have cool photos of these trees. Uh, so there's a river, and these ancient stumps are just being washed out of the bank. And, you know, the bank is a bunch of alluvium. So, so it's basically during the melting time of the, the balling alarod period, these trees, this, this whole area was growing a bunch of pine trees basically and they got inundated with silts from the from the areas above them up there and then they, the trees were just buried and now it's just these trunks they're still in situ that they still have roots they're still standing up upright it's cool so there's like pictures of the river with these trunks sticking out these ancient trunks that are being washed out as the river you know erodes the banks uh Okay, the solar superstorm in Earth. If the solar storm from 14,300 years ago had struck Earth today, it might have wiped out human systems of telecommunications, satellites, and electrical grids. These scientists expressed their belief in a need to protect human infrastructure from extreme behavior on our star 93 million miles away. Tim Heaton of the University of Leeds said, Extreme solar storms could have huge impacts on Earth. Such superstorms could permanently damage the transformers in our electricity grids, resulting in huge and widespread blackouts lasting for months. <clears throat> Imagine if the satellite systems that bring you cell phone service or internet or GPS are suddenly gone, along with the electricity for warning, warming and cooling your home or cooking and preserving food. Then you'll understand why research into this area is so crucial. As Heaton said, radiocarbon provides a phenomenal way of studying Earth's history and reconstructing critical events that it has experienced. A precise understanding of our past is essential if we want to accurately predict our future and mitigate potential risks. We still have much to learn. So, using tree ring and ice core data from the last 15,000 years, scientists have now identified nine huge solar superstorms. They call these superstorms Miyake events for the Japanese physicist Fusa Miyake, who was the first to identify the radiocarbon spikes. The two most recent Miyake events were 1993 CE and 774 CE, Common Era. The 14,300-year-old Miyake event is the largest that scientists have found yet. It was about twice as strong as the events from 19, or 993 and 774. Yeah, sorry if I got that number wrong. 993. Uh, common era and 774 common era. So without direct observations of these events, it's challenging to learn more about them. Scientists still don't know what causes these powerful solar storms, how frequent they might be, and if we can predict them. Bard said, quote, direct instrumental measurements of solar activity only began in the 17th century with the counting of sunspots. Nowadays, we also obtained de also obtained detailed records using ground-based observatories space probes, and satellites. However, all these short-term instrumental records are insufficient for a complete understanding of the sun. Radiocarbon measured in tree rings used alongside beryllium in polar ice cores provide the best way to understand the sun's behavior further back into the past. So what I was going to say about this beryllium, they measured the C14 in the tree rings, and they got a bunch of tree samples. <clears throat> I think something like 80 of them. Uh, there were many more tree stumps than that, but they, they made a bunch of cuts from a bunch of different trees. Then they discarded a whole bunch of them that were too soft or too degraded to use. Then they had around 70 or 80 of them left. Uh, and then they very carefully dried them out, sanded them smooth, and then took samples. Uh, then they took a bunch of photographs. Right, and then they spent a long time trying to build a complete timeline using all the trees, and that, so they, with all the trees together, they span quite a long time. And the most recent ones connect to the already existing tree ring data 
that goes mm. back to about 13 to 12 to 13,000 years ago. This is the problem is that trees this old uh, are re- much more rare. The Pleistocene trees, pre-Holocene tree ring data is is rare. That's what yeah, they were saying in the like paper. Burned and yeah, they're just captured gone. in floods. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, just turned into splinters. Right. So this is this is an amazing discovery. That's really cool. And they this. were able to actually push the tree ring data with these trees back to fifteen to sixteen thousand years ago. Man, I wish they had a bigger image. I mean, this image is so small. Yeah, I know some of the pictures on the paper are tiny, but. <clears throat> They so they basically they and they they did point out in the paper they were like there are places where we're not quite like the data isn't nearly as strong for connecting these but they're like there are some trees that seem to span the periods because they they ended up picking three different periods of tree growth the earliest one and then a middle one and a and a later one the most recent one and they're like there are some trees that span these two right and we're able to connect them but there's basically like first trees grew there then those got inundated. Mm-hmm. And then newer ones started growing. The older ones didn't all die. So there were a few of those growing, but they were growing at a much reduced rate because they're now yeah. buried in silt for many meters. New trees are growing on top of that. <laughs> those, And then another inundation happens. And then there's new trees after that. And they're, So they made a connection to all of these. They were saying some of the connections are a little weak, but they're, they had enough data where they're like, we're pretty confident in yeah. this map. So then they got this specific year where they're like, there's this enormous C14 spike right at 14300. So then they went to the Greenland ice cores and they looked for beryllium 10, which is another cosmogenic, uh, uh, what's the word? Is it isotope or is it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a metal, cosmogenically generated metal type it... of, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's just cosmogenically generated, right? It's like cosmic that's particles. Redundant. It's cosmogenic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, it's cosmically generated, right? It's cosmogenic. They cut the, the heavy particles come in really fast. They make C14. They also make beryllium-10, which is a radioactive isotope of that of beryllium. Yeah. Um, so they found a spike of that in the Greenland ice cores, right, at the same time, which is a is you know a pretty good indication that it was high energy particles making this okay right that's why they're saying it must be a solar event but i would have to say and this is just i just want to point this out that they're make they're that might be an, a bit of an assumption is there other cosmic events that could cause this to take place that isn't like a massive solar event you know, like a nearby supernova or something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but what's more likely? I guess you have to. You'd have to. You'd probably send it off to the astronomers and be like, "What's the most likely yeah. thing that could create this?" Well, probably, probably there's other data that implies solar events as well, right? I just don't know. Like, I did read through the paper, but a lot of it was so technical that I didn't understand mm. any of it. Um, but they, these guys, when I was reading the paper, I'm like, okay, these guys are thorough and yeah. like, I'm not, I can't assume that they asked this question because it looked to me like they're just saying this is a solar event. Yeah. But really what I saw was this is a cosmic event. Yeah. Well, we don't know if it's the sun. We've talked about this too, that, that like if, if you had a massive comet nucleus that comes in to the inner solar system and it actually crashes into the sun yeah. after going through like severe fragmentation. Yeah. It could cause major solar storms. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have both. You can have an inundation of cosmic material coming from this rogue body plus the solar event that is the result of it like crashing into the sun. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like I also wanted to ask like did they look for an any iridium other, spike? Yeah, iridium spikes or any other. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that. They were looking for specifically like a so they had already radioactive nucleotide, you know, like a cosmogenically generated particles. Well, but would you get would you get carbon fourteen from, you know, what would you get carbon for? That ha- that's also something that, that's high energy particles, right? Yeah, but it's not that kind of high energy. I don't know. You're, that's a good question. We've talked about this with Randall on Cosmographia. Like, do you, would you get C a C fourteen spike from a high energy impact event? I don't know. 
Yeah. I yeah, I am sure that an impact event generates extremely high energy particles, but not on the level that like, like solar, solar events do, yeah. star events. <laughs> yeah. You just, you know, it's, I mean, maybe you get a few, right? I'm sure it creates. But not enough to have a spike that's 10 times. Right. That's global. More, it's like a, an order of uh, magnitude stronger than the Carrington. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like the idea. Then there's there's more on this, but we'll take a break. But I'd like to talk about real quick the the oh well if we could do yeah we'll, we'll take a break we'll come back and we'll keep going on this. out of another cup of coffee <laughs> switching to beer <laughs> I'll be up all night yeah. if I keep drinking coffee welcome back ladies and gentlemen episode 301 the 300th episode of Brothers of the Serpent podcast um, so I wanted to talk for a minute about this idea of losing the power grid for a month or months mm-hmm. and really it's you know can we continue to ship goods? Can we continue to grow crops? Yes, but not the way we have been doing it. Yeah, right. Like shipping would totally change. Yep. All of our all of our boats are using uh, engines that could be possibly uh, ruined by a massive CME if yep. they weren't. Some of the components may go bad. Digital components going bad. Yep. Um, we can still grow crops, but in places where uh, irrigation is in use and the irrigation is using pumps that are using the electrical grid, like that's all going to stop. Yep. So you could have mass crop failure Yep. Uh, in places where we're growing crops that crops don't grow. Like that's that's yeah. the deal. And and there's this... That's the surplus. That's, yeah. That's... This, the system that is set up around this. I mean, we're, we're shipping so much uh, food all over the world. Mm-hmm. Food is moving all over the world from a lot of places. Yeah. And that would temporarily halt. And it doesn't take long. Yeah. You know, before that's a huge problem. So it's it's not that like, I, I think, I tend to think that uh, we'll figure out ways to, to get around it. And to, like, obviously, civilization or humanity is not going to, to, just like die out. But these massive systems would cease to function the way they they normally function. And we don't have uh, a, you know, inventory for months everywhere. It's yeah. it's it's only going to last a short amount of time before everybody has to find a different solution to whatever problem they're dealing with. Yeah. Like eating their neighbors. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's going to cause huge problems. So yeah, it would it would be catastrophic in that sense. Um, and I mean, cities, you know, cities is where it's like, wow. That's what I'm saying. I like, I have very, I have low expectations for cities. It'll be, I've I've read enough books and played enough video games to know it's cannibalism in a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. In a week, it's like everyone is. A lot of people are, 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 yes, stealing from other people who have stuff, right? And then once all that's gone, there's cannibalism, it becomes Mad Max, and then there's an explosion of whoever survives that terrible thing out into the surrounding areas. Spikes and blades on vehicles. Yeah, yes, exactly. Giant spikes. (laughs) You have all the people who survived the zombie apocalypse in the city spreading out from the city, so they're the most, like... They're, you know, they're the most violent but ones. The things, the <laughs> things you don't think about, like sewage, right? Like, there are so many pumps and things involved yeah, in dealing yeah. with sewage. 
to yeah. move this material, this poisonous material, out of wherever we are. Yeah. And when those fail, and process it. Yeah. 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 That then when that system fails, then it it stops moving. It gets blocked up. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't have a way to deal with your own excrement. Yeah. And then that waste builds up. Yeah. yeah. Waste builds up. It becomes ah. It's just yeah. It's stuff like that. You don't that we just take for granted every day because these systems are working behind the scenes. We don't even notice. But, yeah. you know, you live out in the hills, you notice. Because <laughs> you're dealing with your own shit. Yes, that's right. We all have our own system. <laughs> I have many times <laughs> taken a look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Had to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you appreciate those systems, but yeah, I can't even imagine like in a in a in a city where you're potentially miles from any ability to grow a crop, yeah, or to find fresh water. Yep, and you're just it, it, they're so closely packed that the that the sewage systems like, <laughs> I mean, it's critical. Yeah, you go back to like you know dumping the pail out the window. <laughs> yeah, into the street. Right. Somebody else's problem at that yeah. point, right? That's, yeah. I mean, I, I worked for, up in the Northeast, I did some work for, you know, uh, sewage treatment plants. I was helping with some of their computerized stuff. And they're dealing with 30 or 40 million gallons a day. Yeah. You know? That's how much That's they have crazy. to process. And just to stay, just to, to stay on stay top. Ahead of yeah, what's just barely stay in. ahead of what's, yeah. And it's, I mean, these plants are enormous. I mean, they're, yeah. Yeah. and they're always... Almost always at capacity, right? And so they're all they're constantly like, How can we add more pumps? How can we add another pool over here? And they're, you know, and so like you go there and you look at that and like if everything stops, all the electricity stops and this plant stops being able to move this stuff through, mm -hmm. then everything in front of that stops moving. Yeah. You know, and it just it doesn't go anywhere. And we've discussed this before too, where it's like you think, Well, I've got a I got a tank of gas, I got some extra gas cans, or I've got this yeah. spare well, what if your vehicle doesn't work? Right. Because it fried. Yeah, because it has a computer in, there. in it. Yeah. And so it's like, that's really when it gets sketchy. Yeah. When, you ca when all of the vehicles don't even work. And then, not to mention that, if it's that powerful, then it could be creating fires, like, at, you know, at every transformer, yeah. possibly in the wires, in the walls. Yep. So it could be, you know, that, I would, I would imagine that would have to be extremely powerful. Uh, CME to create a to induce enough current into the wires in a house to where it would catch fire. But you know we were talked about the Carrington the Carrington event. event did that with the telegraph wires, right? But they aren't they the telegraph wires come down and there's like a big open coil transformer or something right Could there. Be, yeah, I don't know. I haven't built on a wood block. <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, we have a lot more uh, safer systems nowadays. But still, I mean, it it's it's a potential problem. Yeah. But, like, the other day, you came home and the, the top of the telephone pole was on fire. Yeah. Because the transformer or something there just, or was it a lightning strike they, or whatever? They assume it was a lightning strike, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think there was a transformer on that particular pole. Oh, no? It's not yeah. for the, wasn't for the, the house? The transformer's at the corner? No. Oh, okay. This was, like, in the middle of the run. So but yeah, I was driving home and there's, like, a torch up in the sky yeah. at night. And I'm like, that's a telephone pole, a power pole, and the top of it was burning. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. So the other the other thing that's interesting to me is a, a good friend of the family, uh, Clay. He has a business where he rents he he stockpiles used transformers, gigantic transformers, and huge breaker switches. Uh, I think it's it's like he's dealing with like what is it like thirty four thousand volt switches? Yeah. And, breakers massive. and stuff like that and then these these massive transformers they get uh from you know demos or wherever he gets them and they they refurbish them and he stockpiles all this stuff in, in warehouses and when disasters happen power companies and and big industrial facilities or whatever suddenly need like they, they have a breaker fry or they have yeah. a transformer blowout and they, and you can't just buy these things. Yeah. There's not a store of, you know, <laughs> giant transformer mart yeah. where you can go grab your transformer. <laughs> so that's basically what he built, is giant transformer mart, mm -hmm. except you rent them. 
Yeah. And he's, he, you know, he, he, he'll he have, like, a, a disaster will happen, and then, boom, he's, like, sending all this inventory to be retrofitted or plugged into these giant electrical systems to keep the grid going. And he's constantly stockpiling these these uh, items, but the idea of a of a CME powerful enough to fry every transformer, yeah, it's over, right? You, I mean, you're months from. I, I think months is is even possibly that's a, way too uh, soon. soon. Yeah, because yeah. you, you have to build these things. That's a very uh, optimistic estimate. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to build enough of these things to get the grid back on. And how do you build them? Without power. without any power, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's not only that, but um, the transportation to get them where they need to be, all all of that stuff. And then and then the other question is, will the transformers that are not even plugged into anything, they're just sitting on the ground, they're gigantic coils. Yeah. Will they be induced and burn up? Even the entire inventory yeah. in the warehouse is just torched. Yeah. And. Uh, it's not known. The other thing you have to think about is, you know, all these power generation places. Like, what happens to nuclear power plants if all of their electrical systems go offline? Like, a lot of them are built with all these... and concrete. Well, that's what I'm saying. All <laughs> start, the, you know, you start a lot of them concrete, now are... Bro. Yeah, <laughs> melting concrete. A lot of them now have are supposed to have safeguards built in to where, you know, yeah. they the the reaction is slowed they down They don't shut go into off. meltdown, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like it's like the uh, it's like the way brakes work for for transport trucks. If the brake system fails, it actually puts the brakes on. Mm -hmm. So the whole system is designed to pull the brakes off. Yeah. Right. When you push the brakes, it's actually turning the system off. Yeah. And so that the that that's that's the idea with the the nuclear power plants now. If like the system breaks, this it. it it disengages everything. Yeah, it pulls all of the yeah the heavy elements away from each other. Right, so it doesn't... but the, uh, is that reliant on electrical systems? Is my question. Hopefully, it's reliant on gravity. Yeah, like that would be the best way. Yeah, to do gravity it. or some you know release of hydraulic something. <laughs> right, I, I don't know, but yeah. You know, suddenly, if you have every nuclear plant in the in the world also going into like critical mode because they suddenly lose all of their electrical systems and computer control. Then now you have a, 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 like a hundred other disasters about to happen. Yeah, you know that reminds me of Chernobyl. Highly recommended series to watch Chernobyl. Yeah, that literally like the i it's it did a great job of just like terrifying me about like these <laughs> invisible waves or particles. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just ah man, that was a good series. Yeah. So it's. I think it's. They are always saying, you know, all oh, months or a month or whatever. Like, no. I mean, I just. I. I don't think so. Like, if you don't have any power anywhere, you can't build new stuff. We got to replace the things we lost. Yeah, we got a. We got a little taste of, <clears throat> you know, during COVID, what it does to the supply chain when you shut shit down. Yeah. And, and it's, it's still. It, it's still it's still recovering. happening. Yeah, you're right. This. The, it's uh, like stuff has never completely. It's not back to the to the to the streamlined yeah. way that it was just yet. I mean, we're we're ordering a right. lot it of right. It caused materials. turbulence in the flow that yeah. is still visible it's today. It's still yeah. reverberating. Yeah. It's, golly. So to imagine this is just man. I don't know. Yeah. Months is is very optimistic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then that's the other thing is like we're all going to die. We have a massive digital economy. You know. Like there's a whole bunch of. Basically, you know, we don't need to get into all of this, but like the entire stock market, there's all kinds of digital money mm -hmm. that it's just going to vanish. Like, is there paperwork yeah. on this stuff? <laughs> you know, is there paper records or is it all digital? Like, Start saving up those donut shaped, donut shaped rocks, folks. <laughs> you know, just in case. Yeah. Listen, I have three giant donut shaped rocks on my property. We can go to bottle caps like in Fallout. <laughs> I like the idea of donut shaped rocks. You can't yeah, move you them. Can't move big. them around. That's right. Yeah, it's a perfect bank. <laughs> you can't rob somebody. It's just like you know whose name is on that donut shaped right. rock. Yeah, who owns that particular donut shaped <laughs> rock that no one can steal? <laughs> That's right. That's a great monetary system. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Enough doom and gloom there. Let's go yeah. back to the doom and gloom in the article. The Carrington done. event. Yeah. Back to earthsky.org. Uh, by the way, the 1859 Carrington event, which is well known in our time, wasn't large enough to be considered a Miyake event. We know about it because it occurred relatively recently and the people who experienced it left behind their observations. As the scientist's statement explained, the largest directly observed solar storm occurred in 1859 and is known as the Carrington event. It caused massive disruption on Earth, destroying telegraph machines, and creating a nighttime aurora so bright that birds began to sing, sing believing the sun had begun to rise. However... They know what the birds believed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is, yeah. Clearly the birds believe. Maybe the birds are singing because they're like, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, we're going out singing. That was their CME song. <laughs> <laughs> However, the Miyake events, including the newly discovered 14,300-year-old storm, would have been a staggering entire order of magnitude greater in size. Mm. Bottom line, researchers analyzing tree rings from the French Alps discovered the largest known solar storm, which happened 14,300 years ago. If this storm hit today, it would wreck some critical human infrastructure. I just, again, it's, I feel like there's they're kind of Soft play in the, mm -hmm. yeah. Don't worry. That's all right. Yeah. But they did say, like, this is why we need to, you know. No, they have, they have other things to terrify the population with right, right now yeah. that are just way more important. Right. That's right. Okay, so this is from the actual paper. Uh, I did find this at the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Uh, it is called a radiocarbon spike at 1,400 cal uh, calendar years BP in subfossil trees provides the impulse response function of the global carbon cycle during the late glacial maximum or during the late glacial is where it ends okay so they in the abstract there's some cool stuff in here uh so they say they present the new c14 results um there is an abrupt spike occurring in a single year at 14300 to 14299 right like the, it's it's in that growing season yeah. yes yeah wow it is not present in the tree rings around it yeah. at all. Uh, then the beryllium tin record in Greenland ice was used as an input of carbon cycle model. Uh, the correspondence with the beryllium tin anomalies allowed them to propose the 14.3 calendar year BP event as a solar energetic particle event. So this is what I'm saying. They basically are saying because we have beryllium tin anomalies, this is what lets us say it's a solar event. And I just, I mean, I went through the paper looking if they had other data mm -hmm. surrounding this. Like, is there something else? Because beryllium-10 is created by high-energy particles from space, not just the sun. Right. So I was trying to find, like, why do they specifically think it's the sun? And I, mm -hmm. I couldn't find an answer to that question. So I'm... Assuming it's an assumption <laughs> on their part. Probably a strong assumption, a good one, but well, it is, I'm just yeah, saying but, it's but it possible. A, it's a combination of beryllium-10 and carbon-14. Yeah, so. both of which are created in high-energy particle collisions in the upper atmosphere. Yeah. And high-energy particles are created cosmically, not just by the sun. Right. The sun actually pr produces very few of them, relatively speaking. The most of cosmic rays that are coming in are from distant, deep space, not even our galaxy. Yeah. You know, it's just the space is full of these. So you're, you're suggesting that this could be a supernova or something nearby. Yeah. 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 I mean. Wouldn't they have, they should have data for, I mean, if like some nearby star, supernova in the past 50,000 years. You don't think the astronomers would be well, on that's that already? I, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, is it how close does the star have to be to cause a spike like this? Yeah, I don't know. Real close. Yeah. <laughs> it could also have been it could also have been something weird like a uh, like a black hole collision or you know, anything that creates high energetic particles. Uh if it's in our galaxy, then it's it's generally close enough to like it can, you know, a a, a supernova that happens uh, close to us. Like if we had a supernova within, I don't know, let's say ten light years, it would kill 
everything facing it. Mm -hmm. It could. It wouldn't. It doesn't necessarily have to, but it could. When the blast wave gets here, with the the wave of high energy particles, which is slightly slower than light. Yeah. Right. Not much, but slightly slower. So it, it's not the material. The uh. It's weird. There's like three different waves. First, the the actual light hits us. That's got gammas and all kinds of dangerous radiation in it as well. Uh, then you have uh, the very fast high energy particles that are traveling at relativistic speeds. These are the cosmic ray particles. And then you have the actual blast wave of physical stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the physical stuff could take the mass 10,000 years to get here. Yeah. <laughs> but the... The light gets here at light speed, and then the high energy cosmic ray particles get here a little bit after that. They're traveling at 99.9999999% of light speed. Yeah, wow. So it might take them hundreds of years to get here. So, anyway, I looked to see if they, I, I would, again, and I've said this already a couple of times, it's probably a good assumption that it was the sun. I'm just yeah. saying, it doesn't have to be, it could be something else. Okay, so. Uh, so the correspondence with Beryllium 10 anomalies allowed us to propose the 14.3 calendar year BP event as a solar energetic particle event. By contrast, the 14 calendar uh, year BP, uh, K year, so 14,000 year BP event lasted about a century and is most probably a common Maunder type solar minimum linked to the modulation of galactic cosmic particles by the heliomagnetic field. What? <laughs> We also discuss and speculate about the synchroneity and possible causes of the 14,000 BP event with the brief cold phase called the Older Dryas, which separates the Balling and the Alarod millennium-long warm phases of the late glacial period. So this, it's interesting because this 14.3 event, which lasted only a year, it, it it lasted a year in terms of the massive spike. Was there a Maunder minimum in there? That's something? what they're saying. I, it's a, yeah, because the a first... Maunder type solar minimum. That was what it happened during that minimum. Yeah, there's the, the older Dryas is about 100 years long. It is between the Balling and the Alarod. Yeah. And they're saying it's associated with a Maunder minimum. But they, then you also have this solar flare that happens right in the middle of it. Yeah. So during a solar minimum, you get this enormous Massive solar flare. Yeah, so anyway, the paper's very interesting. Uh, the whole beginning is really cool. Once you get into the second half, it's incredibly, uh, like, technical. I didn't Obviously, understand a lot of it. it's a micronova when the sun was switching from Saturn oh. to its current body <laughs> it's occupying. It could be. <laughs> Uh, let's see. There was some. It'd be something... cool if somebody came up with a some mm. kind of yeah theory to explain all could that. Be a, there could be a good theory to explain this stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. So as they say, in addition to the heliomagnetic and geomagnetic modulations of galactic cosmic rays, it has been proposed recently that abrupt C fourteen production maxima could be linked to short-term energetic particle bursts released by solar flares and coronal mass ejections from the sun. So you see, they've got could be, and it has been mm -hmm. proposed. This is why they're basically saying, this is what I'm, as far as I could tell, they're saying, okay, so this has been proposed, seems like a good idea. Here we found a spike. We propose that this is caused by a CME. Yeah. Challenge us. Yeah. Yeah. The first solar energetic particle spike identified was for the year 774 Common Era and manifested as an abrupt C14 step, uh, an increase in 15% uh, occurring over a single year in recent trees from Japan. The existence of the 774 CE event at a global scale has since been confirmed by measurements on many other trees from different locations spread over the planet. In addition, corresponding annual spikes for other cosmogenic isotopes, beryllium-10, and I uh, don't know what that one is. Maybe chlorine 36 have been found in polar ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica, providing further information to characterize the particle flux. 
The discovery of the 774 CE spike fostered new C-14 measurement programs on tree ring series from the Holocene at an annual resolution. This is an enormous task since before this discovery, tree ring calibration had mainly been based on C-14 ages measured on decadal wood sections. So 10 decadal, year, decadal, sorry, 10 year wood, uh, 10 year periods. So far, four spikes have been evidenced with multiple cosmogenic isotopes, and then they list all the different years, starting at 774, going all the way back to 7360, calendar years be before present. As a follow-up to our previous work to extend C14 calibration during the Younger Dryas period based on subfossil pines from the French Southern Alps, we have measured C14 in trees at annual resolution over a 700-year window belonging to the balling Alarod period. The new C14 record can be compared with beryllium-10 data from Greenland ice in order to identify variations linked to cosmogenic production changes, notably at 14.3 at, uh, thousand BP, during an abrupt event proposed as a new spike. This comparison is also useful to evaluate the influence of the carbon cycle in the heart of the deglacial period. Indeed, the C-14 signal due to an abruption, abrupt production spike constitutes the impulse response function characterizing the entire global carbon cycle. So there's a whole bunch of cool data in this paper. I do recommend people check it out. I can't believe they don't out. make a single reference to Meltwater Pulse 1A in there. Yeah, there's, there's nothing. Maybe they're afraid well, that they wouldn't get published. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That's awesome. We it, you should forward that to Alan West. Yeah. So I'm sure you've seen it. There, here's some de a little bit of details. 172 subfossil trees were discovered in a 500 meter long and three three 30 meter wide stretch of the river. They're buried in loamy deposits, uh, forming a two meter thick alluvial terrace. It, it contains three rooting levels. In other words, three levels of where the trees are. Mm -hmm that are very difficult to differentiate because the loamy alluvial deposits are lenticular shaped, discontinuous, and par only partially preserved. Right, so this stuff is deposited in big lenses and the trees are, mm -hmm. and so these lenses are all mixed up. Uh, in addition, the riverbed inc incision in the river is not uniform. Consequently, some trees have exposed roots, whereas in other cases, only the upper part of the trunk protrudes from the water. All trees are Scots pines and they still stand rooted in situ, except two trees that have been carried away downstream. Most of the trees still have pieces of bark. The height of the remaining trunks ranges from a few centimeters to one meter high. Their diameters range between 59 and five centimeters with an average of 27 centimeters. Uh, they cut them with a chainsaw. They just wanted to, you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever possible, they say two or three discs, five to 10 centimeters thick, were sampled with a chainsaw. One just above the root to estimate the germination date and one higher on the stem to measure ring widths while avoiding the distortions near the collar, which is the area where the roots start to spread out. Uh, so 140 trees were sampled. 32 pre poorly preserved trees were discarded. Um, and then they talk about how they were sanding them up to 400 fine, you know, 400 mm -hmm. grain sandpaper, got rid of the damage and waterlogged samples. Uh, they scrape them with a razor blade to obtain plane surfaces, make ri rings visible, and then they use standard, standard dendrochronological techniques. Uh, they talk about how there's three ages of trees, and they were able to build a map, and then loosely, but in some cases strongly, connect the maps together, and then connect that to the greater map of <clears throat> the Holocene tree, tree ring data. That is so freaking cool. Yeah. I'd love to see, like, the... Ho the, the uh, Comet Research Group go and sample the sediments yeah. at the layers, like the pertinent layers in the yes. sediments for nano diamonds and other proxies. That'd be awesome. Yeah. At that same location. I I also <clears> wonder, <throat> and they, they did a bunch of control attempts. They were like, we did our entire process on these trees. We also did it on known samples of like normal trees in other places and did those dates and checked it so that we now we have they have they can get a an idea of how accurate their their procedure is because it's a really complicated procedure they're using uh anyway i don't need to go into all the details but there's the paper is great so i think they're doing good work and it's really interesting because who who's doing it who's the lead author um do we, do we recognize them hmm Timothy Heaton is the one that I see referenced the most in the articles, but mm -hmm. there's a bunch of people on here. Edward Bard, 
Cecil Marinmont, Manuela Capano. Yeah, I don't recognize the name. Yeah. That's but great. Timothy Heaton is the one that a lot of people, a lot of these articles were speaking to. So anyway, it's really cool. And then if I, what I want to do now is go back and read the uh, Miyake papers, the Japanese guy who initially found these spikes more, much more recently in Japanese trees. And he's like, this is solar storms. Like he was the one that proposed mm. the idea in the first place. That's why they're called Miyake events. Okay. So, and like 774, common era, you know. Yeah. That's that's recent. <clears throat> 774. Yeah, like one, one like 1000 AD, basically. Yeah, that's... Uh, 774, nine something. I mean, I associate that with, I think, the, the Pueblo culture starting in 600. Yeah. It's like the Dark Ages. <clears throat> and he's, he's basically saying, like, these events are powerful, right? You, the Carrington event will not leave a record in the trees. It was not strong enough. Yeah. So for the solar storm to be powerful enough to leave a C-14 spike strong enough for us to see now with our instruments, it has to be at least an order of magnitude greater than the Carrington event. I don't think they even know, like, you know, like, they're just saying, like, how do you estimate the strength of the solar eruption from C-14 in tree rings? I'm not sure. So anyway, there's that story. Very interesting. I'll well, put, I mean, I'll put I the think, links to the paper in the show notes. Yeah, I think the the, the combination with the idea that, like... <laughs> Suddenly, you have this massive meltwater pulse. is pretty yeah. significant. That you know, it's yeah. That's... And I saw Robert Shock, of course, on Twitter, and he's like, "I've been saying that this is these yeah. are solar events. There is no comet necessary, yeah. no impacts necessary." Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yes. I agree. No I agree. impacts necessary, but there's evidence for impacts. Yeah, proxy evidence anyway. I don't, I, I don't see anything in here about a, a CME causing iridium spikes. So yeah. Well, I think he did address that in uh, Forgotten Civilizations, his book or whatever. Maybe he did. I did read that. I don't remember seeing that. Maybe, maybe it wasn't there. I don't remember either. But I thought he was kind of addressing the melt glass. Yeah. You know. And then, like, iridium and platinum spikes. Is that going to be caused from a CME? Or, I mean, I guess you could argue that a very enormous solar event may cause it some kind of uh solar event but is it does it have to be like a micronova i don't even know what that is but i mean i, I was thinking <laughs> I don't think i'm just thinking like okay you have is. you have stuff blown off of the sun like in this in this coronal mass ejection yeah but in general this is not entirely true but in general most of the stuff being blown off the sun is going to be very light atoms, not yeah. metals not on the atoms, on the other yeah. end of the periodic table. Yeah. Now, those, but it's those a metals, giant magnetic field that's like pulling it into this huge band. Yeah, and there's all these metals involved. Maybe I don't know. That's true. That's true. Is platinum magnetic? Is it diamagnetic? I think it all is. Is it? At, at, yeah, it's not highly magnetic like iron. But if it's in a plasma state, it's magnetic. Well, I'm, Plasma's magnetic. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just saying our sun in general is supposed to be like 99.999999% helium and hydrogen. There's the... the I mean, that, that... I could be wrong about this, but I would assume that any of the metals on the periodic table are more magnetic than like Probably. carbon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and yeah. silicates. Yeah. But they're all... Magnet. I mean, the, the the on some level, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the only reason they're a material is due to magnetism, right? Because it's, it's, it's that's because the atoms are magnetic. Yeah, yeah. So, so the magnetism in a metal it's canceled out is is the <laughs> is the result of like a coalescence in a way or some yeah, yeah. some type of uh, greater uh, the the same effect that prevents me from putting my finger through the table is the effect that you detect on two magnets. Yeah. But you're detecting it at a much further distance away from the object. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's it's that's what I'm trying to say is that like it's all magnetism that's like holding everything together, doing all this shit. But uh, so wait, are you saying that that magnetism is the thing that holds the entire universe together and makes it all work <laughs> properly? Man, <laughs> yes. Maybe we should uh, come up with a theory. <laughs> That uses magnetism to explain everything. The reason why your ass is not falling through that chair is because of, magnets. of your magnetic ass. <laughs> okay. okay. Break time. Someone really should come up with something. Yeah, we need a good theory. Like, maybe we can come up with a name during the break. Magna Universe. <laughs> Servant Podcast, second half of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, one story done. <laughs> it only took one hour. Okay, so uh, this is another this is another story that we've been following for years. Kyle initially brought it. Uh, ancient footprints. This is from Scientific American. Ancient fr- fr- footprints affirm people lived in the Americas more than 20,000 years ago. A new study suggests humans arrived in the Americas before the height of the last ice age more than 20,000 years ago. So they're still going with, if this is, this will probably be in the article later, but they're they're going with the idea that these people walked here, uh, which means that they would have had to come into the Americas like 30,000 years ago in order to get through the The corridor. Before the ice closed it up. Yeah. Between the yeah, Cordilleran so if, and the... If they were here 20,000 years ago when the ice was blocking everything, then you have to go back to 30,000 years for it to open back yeah. up. So, Which, I mean, look, I mean, that's... It's fine. It's valid. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's definitely... It just... You, if you think of the, the decades of people who just got ridiculed, scientists whose yeah, careers yeah, were destroyed yeah. because of caves they were digging in where they're like, they, we've got ancient evidence, and they just like... Completely destroyed. They deserved it. <laughs> they it were wrong soon. at the time. <laughs> yeah. <That's right>. Okay. <laughs> yes. It had not been written into the final <laughs> book of That's truth. That's right. The, the manual for how the universe works. Final, final edition. edition. <laughs> Updated daily. Okay. <laughs> Fossilized human footprints found in New Mexico's White Sands National Park were almost certainly made more than 20,000 years ago during the height of the last ice age, according to new research. The study, published on Thursday in Science, overthrows decades of thinking about when humans arrived in North America. The researchers determined the ages of pollen grains and tiny quartz crystals in sediments beside the footprints, which are buried a few feet below the surface. The work confirms a uh, 2021 study's findings, which were based on radiocarbon dates from aquatic plant seeds in the sediments. The new results are statistically indistinguishable from the seed ages, says Jeff Pigotti, a geologist at the U.S. Geological Survey and co-lead author of the new study. We've now got three different dating techniques, radiocarbon dating of the seeds, radiocarbon dating of the pollens, and luminescence dating of the quartz all show people were there. So if you remember the last time Kyle was bringing this stuff, we, there was people were questioning the dates because of the seeds, like, mm-hmm. oh, these were, could have been, you know, yeah. Older seeds. Could have been washed, yeah. out, uh, washed out of the sediments yeah. from, yeah, yeah. The 2021 announcement of the astonishingly ancient age of the footprints, which were found alongside a dried up lake in the park, created controversy among archaeologists. Until then, many scientists had thought that the Clovis people became the first known Americans when they arrived from the north about 13,000 years ago as the ice sheets across North America were retreating. The Clovis are named after a town in New Mexico where their stone spear points were unearthed in the 1930s. But their artifacts have since been found throughout Central and North America. The White Sands footprints, however, suggest humans had already lived in in New Mexico for thousands of years by the time the Clovis culture began. 
Skeptics questioned the dating method used in the 2021 study, which measured the levels of radio, radioactive carbon-14 in seeds of the freshwater plant uh, Rupia cirrhosa, also known as spiral ditch grass, in layers of sediment above and below the footprints. The critics argued water might have flowed through ancient rocks before it was absorbed by the seeds and thereby transmitted carbon that could make them seem older than they really were. I still don't understand that because, I mean, unless they're talking about the seeds being transported, you can't move C14 into the seeds and make them seem older. That would make them younger. Uh, okay. To have more C14, yeah. Yeah. Rather than being leached out of them somehow. Right, yeah. Maybe that's what they meant. Transmitted carbon. Okay. So, the alternative dating methods refute that idea, says co-lead study author Kathleen Springer, a USGS geologist. It is a paradigm-shattering result, she says. People were in New Mexico during the last glacial maximum when the massive ice sheets farther north were impassable. That just flies in the face of all ideas about migrations and migratory routes, she adds, referring to the last Ice Age's peak, which occurred between 26,000 and 20,000 years ago. In the new study, the researchers determined the radiocarbon age of micropollen, microscopic pollen grains in the sediment layers, which hadn't grown in the lake water. They also found the pollen came from plants that no longer grow in the area. There's pollen from pine and spruce and fir, which grow at much higher, higher elevations today, Springer says. So the flora indicates that ecosystem in, extended down into the valley floor 20,000 years ago. The researchers also dated the sediments with a technique called optically stimulated luminescence, which can determine when minerals were last exposed to daylight. Samples for the technique must be processed in the dark, which the scientists achieved by hammering tubes into the buried sediments and studying them under red light that wouldn't affect the dating, Pigotti says. They then measured the almost imperceptible glow of quartz grains in the samples under specific frequencies of light, and the resulting dates matched those from the radiocarbon method, he says. So awesome. The new dates confirm the picture of a now-vanished landscape at White Sands more than 20,000 years ago, when camels, elephants, and giant sloths roamed beside a lake and were probably prey for human hunters. And the human footprint suggests people arrived there up to 30,000 years ago before the ice sheets made migration from the north impossible. I mean, I don't mind them pushing the date back to 30,000 years, but this is based on the assumption that they couldn't arrive by boat. So, I'll just put that out there. Yeah. Some... Meanwhile, Neanderthals were sailing the seas <laughs> right. 300,000 <laughs> years ago. That's right. They were like, we got to get out to that <laughs> island, bro. Looks like good fishing out there. Some of the white sand's footprints appear on the surface as ghost tracks. This is really cool. Which are only visible when the ground is damp. Scientists think they are caused by water evaporating above fossilized footprints that are buried deeper in the ground. Wow. So you, you can imagine you've got this flat hard pan that's the playa, right? This, this dead lake bottom. And deep underneath that, in some harder clay, is the actual footprint. And then that's like a barely... Dense, it's, a denser, yeah. more compact yeah. soil. Yeah, and then it's barely reflected in, this, in yeah. the sands above it. And you can only see it when the light is exactly right or when water is evaporating out uh, of the stuff. And you, you know, suddenly the footprint just appears. Like, so you know, cool. it's magic. Okay. So scientists think they are caused by water evaporating above fossilized footprints that are buried deeper underground. The team dug a trench in the soil to re reveal the buried footprints and take samples for testing. There are thousands of megafaunal and human footprints at White Sands, Springer explains. On some days, you can't see anything, but when the moisture content is just right, they fully pop to your eye. Geologist Cynthia... Leuctus Pierce of the Appalachian State University, who has studied ancient footprints in Tanzania and wasn't involved in the new White Sands research, says the study further supports the presence of humans in North America during the last ice age. This is exciting and will certainly have scientists rethinking how humans interacted with the North American environment during the last glacial maximum, she says. Anthropologists. Kimberly uh, Falk of the Smithsonian Institution, who also wasn't involved in the study, <laughs> is now reasonably convinced of the antiquity of the footprints. These results add to the still scant but growing evidence of human presence in the Americas around the time of the last glacial maximum, she says. 
And that's the end of the article. So I looked for the paper reference on this and found it. It is unfortunately at science.org. There, maybe there's another one somewhere, but science.org is behind a paywall. But there's a summary here, which I can read through some of this. So I wasn't able to read the full paper. But the editor's summary on the paper, which is entitled, Independent Age Estimates Resolve the Controversy of Ancient Human Footprints at White Sands. Editor summary, traditionally, researchers believe that humans arrived in North America around 16,000 to 13,000 years ago. Recently, however, evidence has accumulated supporting a much earlier date. In 2021, fossilized footprints from White Sands National Park in New Mexico were dated to between 20 and 23,000 years ago, providing key evidence for earlier occupation, although this finding was controversial. Pigotti et al. returned to the White Sands footprints and obtained new dates from multiple highly reliable sources, and they too resolved dates of 20 to 23,000 years ago, reconfirming that humans were present far south of the ice sheets during the last glacial maximum. And then the abstract for the paper starts with uh, basically the same stuff we just read. But these ages remain controversial because of potential old carbon reservoir effects that could compromise their accuracy. But we present new calibrated C14 ages of terrestrial pollen collected from the same stratigraphic horizons as those of the seeds, along with optically stimulated luminescence ages of sediments from within the human footprint, Bear, hum, human footprint bearing sequence to evaluate the veracity of the seed ages. And the results show that the chronological framework originally established for the White Sands footprints is robust and reaffirmed that humans were present in North America during the last glacial maximum. So, uh, so what are the ramifications of this? We just talked about, they mentioned the Clovis stuff. I mean, it's it has been seeming like for probably the past ten, five, maybe ten years, the Clovis first has been collapsing. There are still some holdouts. But I think what also collapses with this, and this is they don't even mention this in this uh, in these articles, is the overhunting uh, theory, yeah. the hypothesis, which. How do I say this? Like it relied upon the introduction. One yes. of the big arguments was that the humans animals show up and the human and the animals. The die. animals were not right hunted. used to humans, mm -hmm. so they were not afraid of humans when humans arrived right. 12, 13,000 years ago. That's right, and so they didn't even run away, and they were just slaughtered. Yeah, and total crap argument. Right. I wasn't. I didn't even think of that. You're right. That's part of it. But the other thing they say is that the and I've seen this said multiple times by multiple different people who push this overhunting hypothesis, is that the evidence for the overhunting hypothesis is that humans arrive and the animals die. Yeah. Right? Whatever the cause is, like Kyle just pointed out, the animals weren't afraid, so they didn't run, so they were slaughtered. But these people are basically saying a strong evidence for the collapse of the megafauna being caused by humans is because it didn't happen for a million years, and then humans show up and they all disappear. Yeah. Right? Well, that's gone. Yeah. Now we know that the humans in these megafauna, like they coexisted for Tens six of thousands of years. Yeah, at least six thousand years. If you only go back to twenty thousand, you know, or more than that, if you go back to thirty thousand well, yeah. years. Yeah. 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 But if you if you're a standard model guy, you can't accept that it's only six thousand years. It has to go back to thirty thousand years. That's right. Previous because they couldn't have had boats. That's right. They had to walk. So they coexisted for tens of thousands. 16,000, yeah. 18,000 years, right? Before the collapse of the megafauna. And, and that's assuming that they only walked across the opening mm -hmm. at the end, mm -hmm. right before it closed, which is right. extremely unlikely. Right. They came across when it opened. Yeah. Which would push it back, what, even 50,000 years? <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. yeah, and we're just talking new about the land walkers. New land opens up, and they're just like, eh, let's not go that yeah. way. I don't know, man. Uh, we don't want to go that way. Yeah. No. I mean, you know, if you're standing there, and the glacier cracks and melts away, and you're like, no one's been back there for 20,000 years. <laughs> let's go. Let's not go. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing back there, yeah. guys. <laughs> But yeah, you you know, I mean, like, let's. This is an interesting thing to me as well. Just the 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 thought processes 
that you can go through with what are what are people thinking? And so let's say that you live near the ice mass and you're on the other side. Uh, not you're you're over in Siberia or whatever. And there's just this ice wall, you know, so this you're like flat earth, there's an ice wall, it's the end of the planet, whatever. <laughs> and then and for generations, you know, that's dangerous, it's loud. There's sudden explosions of water from the bottom. You know, you can't live too close to it. And then it just starts to retreat. And generationally, if, let's say it takes a thousand years for it to kind of go away. Right. So now suddenly you're just like, okay, for, for however long, tens of thousands of years, we've had stories that this place is dangerous, but this wall of ice is disappearing. Somebody's going to be like, I'm going to go back there. Yeah. <laughs> well, think about this. What the, These stories coming out recently about this this pass uh, in, what is it, Northern Europe somewhere? Netherlands or where? I don't know where it is. Uh, but it's somewhere we were reading about it where the ice is finally clear and people are hiking up this oh, yeah. corridor mm -hmm. and they're finding arrows, like yeah. entire quivers of arrows and yeah, stuff in there. They're like, ah! <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, global warming is causing, you know, the melting of the ice. It's terrible. Well, there's this new passage immediately. Hikers, the hammerheads are just like, yeah, yeah. let's go. Yeah. And they get up there and they find quivers yeah. with arrows and stuff. So my point is, as soon as that pass opens, you know, the, the people, the explorers of the civilization, I don't care what time it is. I don't care if it's 100,000 years ago or today. And it has to be the explorers, right? The yeah, hunters. they're like, they're like, dude. We can get up that mountain now. Yeah. The hunters aren't going to go there. I mean, unless the hunter is also an explorer, but it's like there's not game. There's no vegetation. I mean, it depends on how fast the ice melts, I guess, right? But like this, these mountain passes, you know, it's like glacial rubble underneath there. Yeah. There's nothing alive. You might be finding gold. You yeah. Might be so finding... you're going to climb up there to explore. Yeah. Yeah. You're hunting treasure. Yeah. Or new lands. Right. Because, I mean, I'm sure that these people look. Wherever they lived, they encountered glaciers. Yeah. And they knew that on the other side of those glaciers was more the, land. The end of the world. No, because there'd be like <laughs> mountain valleys, right? Just... There's these huge valley lobes that are coming down. And people would live on one side of the lobe, and then there'd be people on the other side of the yeah, lobe. Yeah, And then there would be a pass that might open up. Yeah. I, I'm just imagining like, like you, because people are talking to each other. Yeah, they know that there's something on the other side of the ice. I know the joke, but yeah, but my so point I'm just is that to like make a fucking joke over here. <laughs> <laughs> They've dealt with ice in other places where they were able to pass through yeah. it, and they knew there was land on the other side. So when they see an opening, they're like, "Well, we're going to go and check to see what the land on the other side is like." Yeah, that's this is where I'm, you know, because yeah. this is like you said, it's generational, and and now we know how long. And I Oral would, traditions can last. Yeah, and I also wouldn't put it past these, you know, like, like these people aren't just like wandering around not knowing anything about the world. This is kind no, of yeah, like a common, I, I feel like a common misconception about very ancient, quote unquote, primitive peoples that are walking around in butt flaps. Like these people understood nature in ways that we can't even yeah. imagine. Maybe they, yeah, maybe they didn't have like some kind of, natural science explanation for no. it. But they still understood and recognized the patterns and probably far more than we do today. Yeah. And we're able to see little tiny things and be like, okay, And maybe this even means notice that. the birds flying over there yeah. and like, we're going. Birds yeah. are going there. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they I imagine that they saw Yeah, I saw that bird things. just fly from over the ice and it shat seeds on me. <laughs> we are going that or way. They just see it land <laughs> on a branch and shit. And yeah. then they go and inspect it because they're like, well, let's see what, what it brought. Yeah, yeah, what it. did it bring, yeah. Rocks. Nope. White. This is white stuff. <laughs> there's definitely... They do the okay. chuck test. If there's, if, there's, <laughs> if there's white stuff in it, there's definitely something over there to eat. <laughs> <Yeah>. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This do is... the, old, the old chuck lick test <laughs> and find out what's in <laughs> Yeah, but you did that wrong. <laughs> I know. I, th that's fake news. Yeah. Chuck, you just lick no, it directly. You grab the rock and just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gross, lick it off man. the finger. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to like. And I, I'm just imagining, you know, like this is probably like a, a scenario. I don't know if this ever happened, but you can imagine that there's a, a sort of a mountain pass between two villages that maybe they trade with each other. Mm. 
And every year when winter starts to come, they know like, okay, this is the last time we're trading because yeah, yeah, the yeah. snows are coming. And they separate. And at one point that happens and they can't cross it again. Yeah. And then thousands of years go by and people know that there are people on the other side of that valley that they used to be able to talk to mm -hmm. every year. So maybe, and because we know oral traditions can last tens of thousands of years with mm -hmm. accurate information, and maybe they have to keep retreating because the ice is going to spread, right? Mm -hmm. But you still know that over there on the other side of those mountains were people. Yeah, I'm going to get this wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm going to get the history wrong on this, but this reminds me of the Vikings. I, I watched that Vikings series uh. years ago. Yeah. With Ragnar Lothbrok. Oh, yeah, whatever. They, they were like, they know there's and lands he, across and, the water. Yeah, so it's like they had legends that there was this land yeah. of riches across the water, right? Well, of course, in England at the time, like the Romans had been there. Yeah. Had been there in the past, and the kings like still had stuff that was influenced by the Romans. Yeah. So it's like they, but the, the Vikings had this memory. That there was this place, and they knew it was out there somewhere. Yeah. They could, you know, it's. I think that's so cool. Yeah, like it. Yeah, and a bunch of people were just like, "There's nothing out there." Yeah. So yes, I I agree with you. Like, it could have been multiple times. Uh, for, for even much further back that they. For some reason, I don't know why, but that's that started a Monty Python scenario in my head of the Vikings landing and asking some <laughs> British peasants for their riches. And they're like, you want what? <laughs> oh, he's got shit. <laughs> he wants to know if he's got any gold. <laughs> <laughs> they should do it. Monty Python should do a Vikings landing and yes. asking... Give us your riches. <laughs> There's some lovely filth over here. <laughs> uh, okay. So the white sands footprints. Man, that's awesome. Okay, yeah. so the other thing about that, are we going? Are we moving on? No, I no. Just, I can't help also thinking about the white sands. It's just like I, I, I know they're always talking about the, you know, the footprints themselves, and the dating and all of this stuff. But to me, I'm trying to rebuild this story. Yeah. With this scant information, right? This, this, these traces. And I just, I, not only the story of like what, what was going on, but also just like the footprint itself. So imagining the bank of a lake and you're walking along the bank of the lake and you, you're, you know, the idea is that your foot presses down into the mud and you pull it out, and then the fine silts from the water that, you know, in the in the sands close to the water, they they look dry, but you step in it, and you sink down, and then yeah. it fills with water. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that this footprint, in normal situations, can be covered up and preserved down there. So you could walk all the way along this bank and leave a whole set of footprints that without any catastrophe or without any cataclysm, these footprints get preserved. Mm. Okay. And so then the... But... So I wonder about... Uh, this is why I want to visit this place. Yeah. Are we talking about lake levels that are vastly shifting over time? You know, what 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 is the timeline here? Because yeah. this area is huge. And... and in in the previous stories we talked about like the you know the megafaunal tracks are crossing the person's tracks they're saying the person is walking on the bank of the river or yeah. a bank of the lake so i'm like okay the megafauna walking into the lake or coming out of the lake was it a shallow lake is it a, just like puddles or puddle? you know we had talked about is is it a catastrophically draining at this moment yeah is this the end is this why the footprints are preserved here but if they're dating these footprints now to 20,000 years. Yeah. Then, okay, maybe it, there wasn't a, a cataclysm. Yeah. And so then for 10,000 years before this lake dried up, because I think it actually dried up Yeah. after the Younger Dryas period or during mm -hmm. the Younger Dryas period. Okay. Could be. So that the lake was there for however many tens of thousands of years. So are we looking at 
tens of thousands of years of conditionally preserved footprints that just are coincidental. So they're overlapping each other, yeah. and they're you know, or is this? You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. this is the kind of story I want to see, like in a in a, a broad brush idea of like what what are we dealing with here? Yeah. Now, obviously, they're 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 having to go to great efforts to solidify these dates. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to find out if they also find dates at twelve thousand or fourteen thousand, or are they all at this twenty thousand year period? If they are, then that suggests that all of these footprints were made in the days prior to something. Yeah. That caused them all to be preserved and then never again. Yeah. This is what I want to understand about that site. Well, it's like, okay, I think not all lakes are like this, but many lakes have a deep spot mm-hmm. and then lots of lots of shallow, not, mm-hmm. you know, relatively shallow areas around it. So if the lake starts to dry up, you can end up with a small, deep pool that lasts for a lot longer. And then you have enormous areas flats, that were coves that were flats, flats that you so in other words the lake was huge and people lived on the banks of it but then you know you have you you just have year after year of reduced rainfall so the lake begins to shrink and then people are crossing these mud flats and it's only muddy for that year right in some cases not always because sometimes you get rain and it'll come back in but it can be muddy enough, and like there's not a, there's the, the water's low enough for you to cross it. Then it dries out. That mud gets incredibly hard. Then it fills up with sand and all this stuff, and it's just preserved, even though the lake itself now is is has retreated from this whole area. But it used to be water here, so you can have a whole area where it's like preserved footprints from that year. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because okay. it's Cause never it's cut- muddy again, right? Not like it was when there was a lake there. You see what I'm saying? And then that mud, this lake bottom sediment, it dries and it cracks and it becomes incredibly hard. And it preserves the footprints. As but long then as are you saying then, then, then you perhaps get more rains and then it refills, but that sediment layer is now buried and hard. I mean, yeah, hard and it's and, hardened. And, and, unless, and so then you get more varves on top of that. And, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, possible, okay. yeah. Yeah, so that's 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 kind of what I would like to see. Yeah, I'd like to know. I would that. like to see a study of of the overall, you know, I guess they're they're going to continue doing these dates, but it would be great to see kind of an overall study of what is what is the whole situation we're dealing with here in terms of this lake. And the, and what's the, main, the range of dates for the footprints they found? Yeah. Yeah. And the main thing that that about this that one set where there's like this this mile long stretch of like a straight line. Yeah. You know, the woman walking with the child, and yeah. then she comes back without the child, and meanwhile she she went across, and then a, a mammoth crossed, and a sloth crossed yeah. her tracks, and then she comes back by. That just that story just haunts me. Yeah, yeah. And even it, it could be mundane. She's just like, "Oh crap!" The parents wanted the kid back, you know, <laughs> yeah. at, at nine yeah. o'clock or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> she's just running across this. Right. And it could be something like that, but the, but it's it's so beautifully detailed, like in. It, it's it just paints this vivid picture in my mind. Yeah, of the haste with the child pausing for the breaks. Yep, putting the child down, picking it back up, hauling yep. ass, and then coming back at a more leisurely normal pace. Yeah. But you know, meanwhile, a mammoth and a sloth walk by. Yeah. So it's just like <laughs> this is the world you are living in, yeah. and you got this child, and you're a female just by yourself with this child on this giant lake. You know, yeah. With these animals. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. I, I love it. So I would love to 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 learn more about the broader picture here. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I would like to know the 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 ranges of dates they've gotten for prints. Yeah. I think that this it doesn't say like is this the oldest date they found? Yeah, yeah. So this is. I think they're just dating those same prints that they were talking about before. Yeah. So this is the. Um, this is probably dating the same tracks you same were just tracks, talking about. Yeah. yeah. Because those are the ones where they were like, "Look how well, they, old these are," and yeah. then they got scurped. They say they've they've found hundreds of thousands of prints. Yeah. In this place, so we got it. This is a big, a major, like high priority target for me to to go visit. Yeah, I we need to visit go visit this place. It, yeah. Yep. Uh, maybe talk to some people and learn learn as much as we can about it. It's so cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, not much time left in this segment, so I'll, we'll get started on this. This is another one from Scientific American. 
Uh, 10,000 pre-Columbian structures could be hidden beneath the Amazon rainforest. I had this one. Okay. Yeah. If this new estimate holds up, scientists have yet to identify the vast majority of earthworks strewn across the Amazon. This was published on October 5th of 2023. So, in the millennia before European colonizers invaded the Amazon rainforest, throngs of indigenous people moved mountains of dirt to create some 10,000 yet-to-be-identified earthworks across the region. This is according to new research published on Thursday in Science that identifies two dozen sites where massive amounts of dirt formed circular and rectangular geoglyphs, settlements, and religious sites. <clears throat> Based on what the researchers knew about such structures, they estimated the huge number of these mysterious constructions that are likely still hidden somewhere beneath still unsearched forest. The model supports theories that hold the Amazon, which covers a huge swath of South America, was densely populated, and it may strengthen political efforts to uphold the modern sovereignty of the forest's indigenous inhabitants. To look for these sites, the researchers found data gathered for other studies of biomass in the northern, central, and southern regions of the Amazon rainforest, those studies relied on a so-called light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, system that bounces an airborne laser off of Earth's surface as it passes overhead, measuring trees, canopies, but also revealing the ground below them. Uh, we thought maybe the ground can tell us some stories about the archaeology as well, says Vinicius Peripacho. I don't know how to say his name. A doctoral candidate in remote sensing at Brazil's National Institute for Space Research and co-lead author of the new study. At the beginning, it was a complete shot in the dark. We had no idea if we would find anything. But in that initial data, which represents less than one-tenth of one percent of the Amazon's total area, he and his colleagues found 24 novel earthworks to add to the nearly 1,000 previously known examples. The new sites are between 500 and 1,500 years old. This is much younger yeah. than I was expecting. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. They include a fortified village, other settlement sites, and religious structures. Uh, the fortified village had a central plaza, which would have been part of a local urban network on the southern in the southern Amazon, while geoglyphs included a cluster of ring-like designs. Geoglyphs are a type of land art in which dirt is shaped into designs that can be viewed from overhead. <laughs> <laughs> Next, the researchers used computer modeling to analyze known earthwork sites and predict their spread across the Amazon. That work considered a range of geographical factors such as distance to water, elevation, and soil types. Sandy soils, for instance, make short-lived earthworks. That work yielded the estimate that there are at least 10,000 earthworks, perhaps even twice that many, hidden across the Amazon. To date, scientists have only found about 1,000 such sites. The sheer magnitude of that estimate supports previous calculations of a pre-Columbian population of 8 million to 10 million in the Amazon, says Eduardo Neves, an archaeologist at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who was not involved in the new research. He's confident in those population assessments, even if the true number of hidden earthworks isn't quite 10,000. To be honest, it's hard to evaluate that number, he says of the study's earthwork prediction, but I think it's not off the mark. I think it's a good number. And the experience of archaeologists who study the ancient Maya and have used LIDAR to uncover entire networks of cities hidden in the jungle in Central America suggests that as LIDAR observations of the area develop, their colleagues now beginning such work in Amazonia will indeed find a, new, a trove of new sites. We thought the Maya area was, area was very well studied, but when we started to do LIDAR work there, we had lots of surprises, says Takeshi Inomata, an archaeologist at the University of Arizona, who was also not involved in this study. I think there will be more of those surprises in Amazonia. Yet all three researchers, however, say that the importance of the study isn't so much about the precise number of sites. Rather, it's about the scale of human involvement in the Amazon rainforest. Neves argues that the Amazon is not a natural region that is purely produced by plants and non-human animals and is instead a biocultural one that is defined by the interaction of humans with nature. There is a still common popular perception that the Amazon is a vast, wild expanse, but that's not really true, Inomata says. This study sh really shows well that there was a lot of involvement of humans in this environment. For instance, the scientists also studied which trees were commonly found near earthworks and noted species that include the Brazil nut and the bread nut. That analysis suggests people were cultivating these trees and their tasty offerings at sites they frequented. It's both another clue archaeologists can use to target their search for earthworks and a clear form of people leaving their mark on the forest they lived in. 
Uh, they go on to say that this mark may have real political consequences for their descendants who are fighting to hold on to the Amazon in the face of agricultural interests and others that it could infringe upon the forest. Researchers say that the new study supports indigenous people's claims of having permeated the Amazon and making it their own, which can strengthen their chances of gaining official stewardship. Uh, there's no future for the forest without a future for the people who have been living there for the last millennia, Nevis says. Okay. So yeah, I was, I was interested to read this, but I was surprised at the young age mm -hmm. of these sites because I thought that a lot of these earthworks they were finding were very ancient. But is that, that's not the case. And also they were- Well, I mean, how are they dating these? Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. So again, I, with this one, I went to- I immediately- through was skeptical of I went to dates. look for the paper science.org uh, more but than 10,000 it, it's not that they couldn't it's okay it's not that they can't have that there can't be some that are that old sure yeah but it, to say oh there's tens of thousands of them and they're all this age and like we've only found a tiny fraction right <laughs> it's like okay bro yeah <laughs> So the uh, abstract for the paper that the, all this was based on says, uh, indigenous societies are known to have occupied the Amazon basin for more than 12,000 years, but the scale of their influence on Amazonian forests remains uncertain. We report the discovery using LIDAR information from across the basin of 24 previously undetected pre-Columbian earthworks beneath the forest canopy. Model distribution and abundance of large-scale archaeological sites across Amazonia suggests that between 10,272 and 23,648 sites remain to be discovered, and that most will be found in the southwest. We've also identified 53 domesticated tree species significantly associated with earthwork occurrence probability, likely suggesting past management practices. Closed canopy forests across Amazonia are likely to contain thousands of undiscovered archaeological sites around which pre-Columbian societies actively modified forests, a discovery that opens opportunities for better understanding the magnitude of ancient human influence on Amazonia and its current state. That's the, uh, the beginning of the abstract there. So it's cool, you know, they, that... Uh... We've got all these earthworks. I was looking at pictures. I just showed some uh, in the video, but I was looking at some other pictures the other day when I, I, I didn't see the exact ones. But the, the combination of this square next to these circles, I mean, these are so similar Yeah, to the stuff that was made in the Americas, in, the, you know, yeah. in North America, in the geoglyphs, if you would call them that, or the mounds of America. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, when I, well, sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but when I went through this paper, most of it was about their method for predicting how many sites are yet to be discovered. I didn't yeah, see yeah. a whole lot of the yeah, paper about statistical, dating. Yeah. Yeah. It's a statistical analysis. Yeah. Um, so in other words, the, the headline can be slightly misleading. They didn't find 10,000 sites. No, they, they found didn't. 50 and they're saying there could be 10 to 20,000 unknown sites. Based on because it's it's kind of like, you know, with the telescope, they look out yeah, and they see a bunch of galaxies in this one random dark spot. And yeah. They're like, okay, there's this many galaxies yeah. in the universe. Yeah. It's the same situation. Well, we're and just given the scan Copernican this principle, area. there's this many galaxies everywhere <laughs> in every point of the universe. Yeah. So uh, here's my point, that we've got these mounds, we've got this whole um, system of mound building in the Americas. Uh, they did lots of these same types of things, trenches, you know, big trenches with a mound on the side. Obviously, they're yeah. digging out. And in a lot of cases, they moved the dirt quite a long distance yeah. to build these mounds. They were all thought to be fairly young and then of course uh the the mounds at this it is at the um oh yeah 15,000 year old site or whatever yeah, yeah. The, one of the mounds that's on a university campus yeah and i can't remember the name of it uh i wish i had the watcher here um nope this is cahokia i was trying to look it up real quick but anyway the point is uh whatever that university was <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, they 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 found out that the mound was begun. The the, the first part of it was being built like fourteen thousand years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So again, like, okay, yes, you 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 probably had a um like a tradition of doing this type of thing, and some are younger, some are much older, and some may go way far back. So to just blanket the entire, like you're, you're going to do a LiDAR scan, and then you've maybe actually walked around on a few of them, these dates are not reliable, is my point. Yeah. Like they, you know, these things are so similar to the stuff that we found in, in the Americas, and... Some of them, or at least one or two of them, have been found to be like fourteen thousand years old. They began, yeah. so yeah, uh, they, they're they're really interesting too. The ones you know, we've got that uh, that Squire and Davies book or whatever, yeah. with the, and and the the geometry of these things and how the circles enclose in many cases like an exact number of acres, yeah, and then the square next to it encloses the same number of acres, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This yeah. is not easy to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, you know, this is the the ancient uh, uh, Masonic tradition of squaring the circle. Yeah. Using fake math. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's, I'm, I'm just excited about, about that, uh, seeing more of that and getting more LiDAR data and just seeing what, what all is down there. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll find the uh, Lost City of Z in the process. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Break time. Yep. turn yeah <laughs> final segment ladies and gentlemen episode 301 i know my job 300 episodes i got this down i just got it down <laughs> zero mistakes fastest two hours in podcasting it of is. course it is fast i can't believe those those three news stories took uh most of the show i mean it's good because those i knew those would be we would have those a lot of great. discussion yeah. around them i mean you know not so much with the the main reason for the Amazon one was I just wanted to point out that it's a little bit misleading because, like, when I first saw it, I'm like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, I know, me too. You know, this is why. See, this is how I end up not doing stories on the show. But that's why it's good. You can point it out. You read the story, and then you're like, "This is bullshit." You're right. I've lost my way. <laughs> I haven't been doing stories, and I had this story, and I was just like, I'm reading it, and I'm just, I get to the end, and I'm like, "Wah wah." <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not. Uh, but right, I had but it. It's bookmarked. like there are headline readers, you know, and it's so it's like this is it's good to dive into it and be like, okay, here's what they're actually saying, despite yeah. what the headline appears to imply. And it's great conversation. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, we've done these rabbit hole rabbit hole episodes before, where we spend the entire episode of the podcast sort of talking about like where are we at right now with a lot of these topics we discuss. And we only have one segment left, so we don't have time to do the whole thing. But I would say, in general, the like one of the big things that has changed for me, and we have discussed this before, is, you know, in the early days of the show, basically up until we went to Egypt, uh, you know, we we did a lot of speculating about these ancient sites all over the world, and then you would go to Egypt and you just find out that so much of that stuff we discussed just kind of it just disappears. Yeah. And so it became, it suddenly became clear to me that like you can't, like you can do all the armchair studying you want, but once you go to the site, it just changes everything. Like if some things become totally clear, it's not like you suddenly understand, it, like the mystery is still there, but it, the nature of it has changed. In other words, you are better, better able to ask the correct questions, <laughs> right? That's a really good way of putting it. And it's, yeah. it's, so you get rid of all of these 
all yeah. of these assumptions that are, I mean, immediately clear that they're completely wrong. Yeah, that's right. And like, so that that in and of itself changes your your line of inquiry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and the same thing happened. We go to Turkey. You know, oh my God. we've talked about Gobekli Tepe a bunch of times, and then we go there and we start looking into it. We're and then you just like so a bunch of the stuff that we had previously discussed about the site that had intrigued us and mystified us about it just went away, uh, and now yep. it's new things. Yes. So for me, this has made uh, this has made me like reluctant to want to talk about other sites that I haven't been to, which is you like want to speculate. You don't yeah, this is so. This is like yes, exactly. So this is like um, extremely limiting. When you're a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you guys, I don't know, you, you didn't give me permission to tell this story, but Russ was telling me that, like a while back, I guess this was maybe within the last six months, he's just like, I don't know, man, like, can we just do this forever? Forever? Like, can we do a two hour show every, <laughs> every week, week? Like, for the rest of our lives? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, because, you know, you bring all the content and I comment on it. It's easy. But, yeah, I mean, I understand like this, how this sort of plays into that. It's like, well, yeah, you know, all right, we're looking at all this stuff and you don't want to just sit there and I feel like it's a waste of time, not podcasting. It's a waste of time, like, right to talk about Peru. I haven't been there. I need to go. We're going to go. Right. But now that we've been to Egypt, we've been to Turkey, and I've seen the effect that going to the sites and really getting to explore them has had on all the stuff I previously thought about the sites makes me reluctant to talk about these other places I haven't been to yet. You haven't been to Peru? I haven't. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's exactly what he was saying, <laughs> Yes, <dude>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, there's, I don't, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with it, but it's in my personal uh, in my mind and the way that I'm now viewing all this stuff and the way I think about it is when I think of Peru, I'm like, my my first thought is I have to go. I don't know anything, right? All the questions that I previously have may be valid, but I already know that a lot of them are going to just vanish yeah. when we go down there and new ones will appear. Yeah. More valid ones. More valid yeah. ones. And so that makes me reluctant to even just talk about it. You know, I, I, I'm like, I... I at this point, I've said everything I want to say about that site until I go there and see it, right? Not the site, but the, the, these things on a Peru. All I can say is, like, we got to go. But, I, you know, so I've, if I'm thinking about, like, what are we going to discuss on the show, it's not going to be Peru because we haven't been there. Because I, I, I know now that I don't know enough to talk about it, right? All I can say is, it's fascinating. They're megalithic. I want to get down there and see it for myself. Same with, you know, there's there's crazy cool stuff in Japan, uh, Malta, Easter Island, all the other sites that we've ever discussed that we haven't been to. I'm just like, okay. Like, this is how I stand. I don't want to speculate on them anymore until we get to go see them. So right now, all we can talk about is Egypt and Turkey and space. <laughs> no one can go to space, so I can talk about that. I have a similar <laughs> thing. Like, like, I, like my, that's the thing that happened to me in Turkey, which kind of, I even felt a little bit... Um, self-conscious about it because we get down there and we're visiting all the sites and then I start digging up all the papers yeah. and reading all the papers about the... And then I don't remember who, but people I was talking to on the tour are like, you just started reading the papers on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? But the, but the, uh, the reason I started pulling up the papers was because immediately walking up to the site, I'm just like, wait a minute. This is midden. This yeah. is not. And that is, that's, it was seeing the material. And I, look, I mean, we've looked at thousands of pictures of dirt and rocks. Yeah. But there's something about, like, walking up. I can, I can't, if, if somebody showed me a picture of some rocks in the hill country, I wouldn't be able to tell them, like, yeah, that's, that's a, that's an yeah. Indian midden. Yeah. That's right. But if I was there, I would know. Yeah. Handling it a little bit or just seeing a cut. Yeah. You know, that, so I don't, it was something about that that I just immediately was like, no. And then I had to look into the papers and that it was from that framework yeah. where I was able to, to really parse the, the scientific literature on it. Yeah. I don't know that if I had 
read all these papers that it would have had an impact. But I would have been at least loaded with the facts when I got there. Yeah. So yeah, there's I'm not, new I'm stuff not trying com- to make excuses. <laughs> there's new stuff coming out about that too. I've seen that they're they've they've uncovered some interesting new yes. carvings from different sites. Carahan, they're, yeah. they're, they've found some pretty amazing carvings from Carahan recently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like this is the thing. Like I'm, I, I was looking at those stories, and I'm just like, well, you know, I'm yeah. just gonna. It's it's. The other thing is, like like we said with Turkey, we didn't get to visit the museums that have yeah, all the artifacts. Know, so, know. you know, like that's the other thing is like now I also know that there's a huge missing part of the story that we didn't get to we didn't get to see. Yeah. But I'm I'm with you on that, that that seeing it, it it has such a massive effect that it it almost makes everything you thought before just. Yeah. Not even valid. Right. Well, you just you just feel like okay, now I'm asking more valid questions. Yeah. And it just kind of makes you think like, well, all this stuff I said before, they could just throw it out, you know. But for example, the but that stuff is important because then you go there with the right mindset, right? You go there with the mindset of like, okay, I'm I want to investigate these certain things, not just be a tourist, which is obviously what we would do any site we went to. We're mm-hmm. not just being tourists. We're yeah. there specifically to investigate the ancient past. Yeah. You know, to ask questions about the site. So you go there with the right mindset, and that's due to all the previous research and all the reading and all the discussions that we've had about it. It's just weird that once you go, you realize all those discussions are just mostly pointless. You know, that's how I feel. (laughs) Yeah. I understand that. But, I mean, like, for example, the White Sands deal. It's like this... Reading the the stories and the papers on this stuff has has given me this uh, this interest, this broader interest, and 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 it's really driving me to want to see it for myself. Yeah. So it is that that aspect of it is still valid to talk yeah. about to yep. to discuss. Like, what are all these possibilities? And then, of course, we can get there. And then, like everything I've said about it on the show is just like, nope. That's yeah. Yeah. None of that was. Yeah, that's true. probably true. I mean, like, you don't have, we, we don't sit here and come to conclusions. No. So it's not like you're, you know, it, it, it's all, it's, it's speculation. It's asking questions. Yeah. But, but I understand where, where yeah. you're coming from on that. Um, it seems, I don't know. I, I don't want to say pointless because it isn't pointless, but I'm just more reluctant to do it, you know? Yeah. So there's, there's don't yeah I, I think the it's like not a fear of being wrong no but it's more like uh, like we spend all this time on basically pointless ideas because we just didn't have the the data yeah we needed that's right yeah so it feels like a waste of time even though it's not it it just it but that's you know I'm just I, I'm just trying to illustrate it with how I feel about for example the Peruvian sites. You know, I still so, think I still think about them, but all I think now is I got to get down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think maybe for the podcast, like it would be cool to to like occasionally do like a designated like we're just gonna we're gonna look at all this stuff and then just like do a bunch of speculation. Like yeah. if the purpose of it is to yeah. go through these the discussion because I think the discussion always inevitably leads towards more interesting questions anyway yeah um and it's now that it's known that this could all be invalidated by yeah. future <laughs> it's fine you know what I mean? yeah yeah it's like because i i you know i haven't i haven't looked into peru enough i feel like uh it would be cool to like actually like pull up some papers yep. and kind of do some deep dives on that yeah are there are there mod- modern archaeological papers on these major sites in Peru? Yeah. I mean, that we could at least read the papers from Machu Picchu when they were digging yeah. it up in the... Yeah, so that'd be cool. Go yeah. through it and, and try to analyze it from... Because I think one of the brilliant things that... Um, uh, oh, man. just His name just slipped my mind. Uh, Martin Sweatman yeah. did with the, with the Younger Dryas papers. Like, he did these series of of YouTube videos yeah, going through and just kind of showing you uh, the flaws in, in 
analysis or, you know, he was doing an actual, like a, what would be a peer review. Yeah. But just publicly. So that was really cool to see Yeah, how he would go through and say, okay, there's a flaw in the logic right here. Because when you look at their data, like it doesn't make sense yeah. that they're making this conclusion or this jump or this assumption or whatever. That was really awesome. Yeah. And I used those kind of some of those tools when going through the the Gobekli Tepe papers. So it'd be fun to just kind of do that. Like we could just pull up a paper. Yeah. And just go through it on the show and talk about it. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, we could try that. Yeah. Big plans. <laughs> <laughs> Making huge plans. <laughs> yeah. But as far as uh, for me, um, now this isn't really rabbit hole, rabbit hole stuff, I guess, but I feel like we've had this discussion with people. People have emailed about it. We've talked about it multiple times, but the, this this idea of like the 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 concept that I had of um, you know, like my worldview, religion, uh, spirituality, all of that sort of being systematically dismantled by looking into all of these broader, you know, like the more ancient texts, all these sites, like going in, you know, in physics and history and all of this stuff and just sort of like over time just kind of dismantling this this simplified picture of our existence that I had growing up in the church. Yeah. Uh, And then, you know, kind of like getting to a point where I'm like, I don't even know what to do with, you know, faith or uh, belief in a, in a spirit world. And I kind of just like, well, I'll just set that aside for now because in my gut, I still like believe there's something more than like the physical world than yeah. just like what we can see. Like we had talked about this with Heather too. Just consciousness is something more. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's been like a long <laughs> slow journey. And you know, analyzing the biblical text in more of like the snake bros style of looking at everything and like how can this be real, but not exactly what we thought it was or what most people think it is, yeah. and how it connects to other interesting texts, and and then of course, actual archaeological sites and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, recently going through obviously all this UFO stuff with Marty, and I'm just like, ah, you know, <laughs> these guys going out in the desert drawing freaking triangles, triangles. and stuff, yeah, spinning potatoes. Of, you know, it's like <laughs> I'm I'm so skeptical about that, and and so. You know, at certain points, I would be questioning myself, like, well, why am I skeptical? If I do, in, like, deeply believe in some way that there is something beyond all this. Yeah. And there has to be a way that it works together. Why am I so skeptical about them painting <laughs> and saying some stuff? Like, I don't know. So I've, you know, I kind of go back and forth on this. And then, and then we get into the little people and going through all these legends and... Uh, and then talking to Heather with like you know astrology and these things that that you know the, the chakras and all this stuff and it's just you know this stuff helps people it changes people's lives these these UFO encounters completely change their lives all of these this I know it's anecdotal evidence but it's still there are people whose lives have just been completely changed by these things yeah. Uh, you know, religious experiences change people's lives forever. They it, they make them better people. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that's been I've just been really. That's kind of been more of my focus about myself. Just like where am I in all of this, and and like, do I have a, a cannon? Yeah, a head cannon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm talking about cannon, like canonical, like. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah, the the cannon in your head, your head cannon, <laughs> <laughs> not that one. Okay, <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. not not a weapon, a story. <laughs> I thought you were talking about that. No. That's my head cannon. Yeah, so no, that was a response we got from one of the times we went on, with one of the first times we went on Soraya's on where did the road go? Uh, 
I remember, and we like we went on. It was like I think the first time we went on a show with him, and he kind of got us to give a broad, like we gave mm. our broad overview of what we do here mm-hmm. and all the stuff we talk about. And I got this fantastic response from a guy who's a listener to Soraya's show. He's like, "Okay, so you've totally changed my head canon on this all this ancient stuff." <laughs> That's cool. Canon, C A N O N. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like I, I basically, I, I had a long discussion with the Snake Wife about this. Uh, you know, I don't know, like last month. It was some, it was some point after maybe the first or second Little People show. I don't know. It was recent. And because I had been thinking, you know, what do, what is the most, what do I hold as the most likely, I guess if you could put it that way, like what is the strongest sort of inclination in my, like the spirit belief system? And mostly it's of my own creation. It's like this idea that I've come up with, or, you know, it could be a combination of various other ideas that I didn't come up with. But I sort of put them together in this way that's sort of like I couldn't point you to a source that says, oh, this, yeah, you know, it's something that I pretty much came up with. So that's kind of weird. It's like I just came up with my own religion, (laughs) (laughs) my own belief system. Uh, But it's it's again, it's it's like that. My my spiritual beliefs meme (laughs) with the aliens. That's (laughs) that's. (laughs) <laughs> yes. And the whales That's with the it. trident. And the, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I totally knocky, relate like, to those memes. Walking through the desert <laughs> with the lasers coming out of the... <laughs> yeah. Completely relate to those memes. I'm like, yep. That's... How come you never talk about your spiritual beliefs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have one of those. <laughs> but it, I again, it's I am agnostic. Um. Because I don't know. It's not like a... I wouldn't say it's the same as a faith. It's not like I know. Right. But I do have this like deep... Uh, like intuition or gut feeling that like... it That, that there is something. And I can't... That is, that is like... I don't think um, that's ever going to go away. Like it doesn't, doesn't matter how much I get like you know embedded into like physics discussions or or i mean i mean not discussions but you know research or just like diving into physics or cosmology or any of this stuff scientific stuff uh that doesn't you know that's materialistic yeah i can i can follow all the logic there but i still have this like gut feeling that's just like nah, there's, there's more yeah. yeah there's something more um so yeah, I have I've basically decided. Do you think that could be like a built-in bias from the upbringing? It could be. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. But I would say if if I have a faith that that's it. The faith is that there's something more. That there yeah. yeah. That there is something more yeah. like to to consciousness and to my existence and to all of conscious beings existences. So that is yeah, very, very likely that it's from the upbringing, but I, I don't, it's, it's definitely in my gut and I've had experiences. I have had personal experiences that have, uh, validated it to me, yeah. whether or not, you know, it's because of my own bias or whatever. I don't know. I can't weed through that. Yeah. Like some of these experiences were, are older that some are more recent. Like they're, they're, just, yeah, you know, I, we have these phrases nowadays. We call it like, Oh, we're on the path. Yeah. You know, there's this I there's this feeling. Yeah. It's weird intuitive feelings that that uh come in. So this is this has sort of been my focus lately. Um I haven't really been, you know, looking at looking at rocks so much. Yeah. Other than just, you know, occasionally looking for arrowheads. But I mean <laughs> like in terms of like going down rabbit holes. Yeah. I've been more on like really digging into myself and trying to figure out like because because of the podcast, because of these stories coming up with the little people and and the UFO series and these things that we've been focusing on, I'm just like, who am I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's exactly right. laughs> yeah. Who am I even? And I'm fully comfortable with this. I don't. I'm not. 
I don't want people to get the wrong idea that I'm like cert, you know, I'm like struggling desperately or struggling yeah. or searching. Yeah. No, like I, I accepted it's part of the path. That's just... Yeah, I accepted long ago when it, when my sort of my head cannon was destroyed. Yeah, that it was like that was tough, and then like yeah, eventually that... I got over it, and it's just like okay, I'm fine with not knowing. Yeah, there was I agree there was a difficult period. Yeah, for both of us. Uh, when we started really looking into and discussing all this stuff, because lots of very ancient foundations had to come yeah. down. You know, ancient in terms of our lives and the things we had yeah. believed and the way we had looked at the world. And it was a difficult process. But there was also the... Um, there was also the period later where you're like, I can't talk to anybody, right? This is yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go through this whole phase where you're like, this is all I can think about and all I want to talk about, and I can't talk to anybody about this, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're looking for it? It's the my spiritual beliefs. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I that's what I'm saying. Like I'm 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 fine with all that. I'm fine with not knowing. I'm totally fine being agnostic. But I do actually have a preferred idea yeah. that is sort of something of my own. Yeah, I agree. It's a... and, and, you know, it's it's not like, here's exactly what happened. It's just like, it's something yeah, like Yeah, it's like this. I lean towards this. It's, it's yeah. something <laughs> like this kind of idea and thing, which sort of makes this possible or maybe that possible. It's, it's very, it's not super detailed to the point of being like, here's exactly how everything happened. It's yeah. just... It's, yeah, it's just a, it's just an idea that really resonates with me, as Heather would say. Like this idea resonates with me in a way that I under, I feel like it's more true than, yeah, than the other ideas that might be. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I I agree. I think that the, I mean, the UFO stuff specifically, like with this, all this stuff we do with Marty. Yeah, that's it right there. First one, <laughs> I I forgot about the the alligator coming out of the portal. <laughs> that's ah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, those are uh, those are my spiritual beliefs. Folks. <laughs> <laughs> we might need to we might need to talk about that, bro. <laughs> This so is why good. we have the podcast, so that you can discuss this in detail. <laughs> so good. Yeah, it is good. Uh, but yeah, I was going to say, you know, the, the UFO stuff with Marty is, uh, I don't know if it's changing my spiritual beliefs, but it is definitely, it's tweaking my worldview, for sure. Uh, yes. I have... Already been of the opinion for a while now, especially since diving into valet, that the UFO thing is far more complex than, you know, uh, the whole nuts and bolts idea, which is that physical beings and physical craft are coming here from some other world in the in the galaxy yeah. or something. And I know you've been there for a while. Yeah. I mean, like... It seems to be more complicated than that. Yeah. I love the idea that we've discussed this possibility that like maybe one day the nuts and bolts aliens will get here and be like, so have you guys seen like the uh, lights in the sky? Yeah. We came all the way here to ask you what the fuck is going on with that <laughs> stuff because we haven't figured it out either. But yeah, it's just, and then, you know, but Marty's angle, which is really great. One of his angles is he brings in just this, these deep connections throughout the government and all these other military things and you're that. just like I, yeah. okay bro yeah like people have been messing with this for a while now in our modern civilization and who knows how far back it goes and that's kind of one of the little chinks in the armor is that like yeah why would they spend so much resources on this stuff yeah yeah if they didn't think it was worthwhile yeah. Well, I guess they don't always I mean, spend money really like, worthwhile. Yeah, things. I was gonna say, like, we're talking about government yeah. here. They'll spend resources. They, they anyway, care. it's not yeah, it, yeah <laughs> I don't want to get the wrong idea that it's changing my religion. It's just it's just really making me introspective yeah. on on what like what I've left this thing over here on the sidelines for a while and now I'm kind of more focused on like nailing it down. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. But anyways. It isn't it the the UFO stuff is not changing my spiritual view because that and this is I kind of think this is part of what you maybe not what you were getting at but my spiritual thing is like I have I'm like okay 
my only concrete thing in that sense is that there's something more. Yeah, yeah. That's all. All the rest of it, I'm like, okay, I have this concept that there's a there's good and evil. You know, is that ontologically true? Is it like something you can prove? Or is that always perspective based? I don't know. I yeah. tend to think that there probably is some concrete there. Maybe I don't know, the possibility of there being a science of morality. Is that even possible? Yeah. Because it it's it it because one okay. I've discussed the the dark forest hypothesis or dilemma on the show before, especially in the Patreons. Um and one of the things that that really drove home to me, and I, I kind of knew this before, but the, the really looking deeply into the game theory of the Dark Forest hypothesis, it actually, in a way that none of the cosmological discussions, none of the numbers that I know, the trillions of light years, never could bring home is the freaking scale of the universe. It really made me... Gra have to try to grasp it conceptually mm. because when you start thinking about because you know it's like and I've never been able to I've never felt like all the times I've discussed it on the show off the show with other people I can tell by the questions that they ask and the things that they say that I'm like okay this is a scale problem right and I sat down and thought about it a long time and it and once the scale sort of got in my head it, it blew my mind and it, it's just, I don't know how to get it across because people are like, well, look, we, uh, we look out there and we see planets. And I'm like, yeah, like less than 0.0000001% of the planets that are near us in our galaxy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about the whole universe. Yeah. That is the dark forest, right? <laughs> so there's a scale issue, and I, I'm only bringing that up because, well, number one, because I've felt like I've never gotten it across, but the other reason is because does morality have a scale issue? Probably. Like, I can totally see that. You know what I mean? Like, once you back out and you see for something at scale, and this is the question of... And, and Sometimes I, I literally will, like, take a, a very small bug yeah. and, like, go and, like, yeah, you put him put some, somewhere. somewhere safe, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you're stepping on them all the time. Right. And crushing them and just... Like, it, it, at scale. In other words, if you back way out and you're looking at a large portion of the universe, for example, and this is not even... This is, like, just completely ignore time because that's also deep yeah, that's and enormous. So let's scale. just ignore time. Let's just set the problem of time aside and look at the universe... And we're, let's not even look at the whole thing, just a big part of it, like a large, let's say 50% of the universe, which is, you can't even really grasp what that means, okay? But so you're looking at an enormous section of the universe. All throughout that, millions of suns are exploding, entire galaxies are colliding with each other and causing havoc and chaos within all the systems in those galaxies. Quasars are going off and shooting gamma rays that would irradiate everything within the path of those things, and that's millions of light years across in other words death and destruction on enormous scales yeah. is that good or bad what is the morality here you know is someone trying to save whatever's dying and all that stuff destruction is evil <laughs> creation is good Russ. right now let's go down in the other direction of scale let's zoom all the way down into where you're looking at uh, the, the the microbiological realm in a a small fraction of nature. Just go out and get a piece of dirt, you know, a spoonful of dirt, put it on a microscope. Millions of things are killing and eat each other, yeah. eating each other in there all the time. Yeah. Right? So that's happening on a micro scale. It's death and, and you destruction. You just took it out of its environment. Right, you pull it out of its environment. Even, like, now all of it's going to die eventually, <laughs> right? It's going to dry out and become sand. You're like, wow, look at the pretty sand. I rinsed away all the, the yeah. you know. So, what's morality? It's a question. It, it depends on what scale you're looking at it in, right? It's it's inevitable. And so, and how does this tie into spirituality? Well, questions about God or the creator or whatever. Does he look at the universe at scale? Or is he capable of, or he, whatever it is, you know, Heather was saying, the ether, the, the divinity, uh, 
the yeah, universe but, but, itself, but, but all is it of consciousness. Capable of like focusing on one tiny entity. Right. Well, we keep getting told, like the ancient texts imply in some cases that every hair on your head. Right? Yeah. Every hair on your head. Right. The the Bible specifically, every sparrow that falls, whatever. Right. Other texts say it in other ways that like there's a sort of an all father or an all knowing thing, and it is aware. And maybe, you know, with Laird Scranton stuff, it's the same thing. Like, the reason that's possible is because there's a realm in which time isn't a thing. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a permanent, eternal instant. And it can thus look at our universe. Uh, and forever is the wrong word. But it has uh, essentially all of time to see every tiny piece of it and understand it at every possible scale. And so then your question is, well, how does it make moral decisions? <laughs> right? So it's like, I don't even deal with any of those questions. I just think there is something more. I think possibly there is a way that if there's a hierarchy out there, there is a way that this hierarchy can deal with these kinds of problems. Uh, and that I, I guess in general that there is a system that we're all involved in. I just have no idea what it is. And I'm content with that. You know, I love the questions. I like to think about it and talk about it. But I'm not really capable of seeing any of this from any scale except my own. You know, I can conceptualize. Right, yeah. yeah. And I, I think I think that's probably where the roots of morality really yeah. are. Is it is at your at your scale. Scale. What are the moral things to do? And is there right and wrong? Yeah, because you can't yeah. You can't possibly consider morality on a microscopic scale. Like it's just it's yeah. impossible for a person to even conceive. Yeah, because then like every time you wash your face, you're committing yeah. mass murder. Yeah. Right? It's like you couldn't even ex- you can't live that way. Yeah. So you have to take things at scale. And that makes you understand that like there's a universe out there and it's this also is a, taking things at scale. Well, that's what made me realize it. This I'll tr- bring it back to the dark forest. Is this made me see the scale of the universe in a way that I had never considered it before, because I was being forced to view it from the perspective of a civilization, which I can kind of conceptualize. Mm-hmm. I can conceptualize a civilization, a planet of people or of beings, right? And the problem of that planet of beings, looking out into the universe and wondering. Are there dangerous things out there? And how do you even look for it without revealing yourself? You have to use passive mm-hmm. observation. And there's, like, already our scientists, we, we have pinpoint observations and then some broad picture that can't possibly look at stars to see planets. But there's so much data, you know, that they'll have a telescope like look at the big night sky for uh, for looking at cosmic microwave background or whatever, and it takes months for computers to analyze the data. But then astronomers have to look at the data and ask questions to to they have to inquire into the data to even get information out of it because there's so much. Right, this is the problem with you SETI. Think of this microorganism like in the bark of a tree, and it's just like building instruments to look. Yeah, and you know you there's all these pores. The pores are so huge that it's just massive and you're yeah. like on this ridiculously small scale right that every direction you look it looks the same and there's just so much stuff around you but you're really only on one side of a tree of a, a tree. crack of a piece of bark. yeah it's like you know maybe you maybe s- that yeah maybe that microorganism has this crazy conspiracy theory <laughs> that there are giants moving around out yeah, there yeah but it lives for one day yeah what is the likelihood that one of the giants is going to walk past its tree on that yeah. side in that day and it's going to yeah. see it it's going to be looking, right? Yeah. That's So, again, problems at scale. The Dark Forest forced me, in a way, to conceptualize this in a way that sort of brought it home because you're, now you're like, okay, the universe is really big. Yeah. And, and this is the other thing. I, I don't, you know, I keep going back to this because I always feel like I haven't explained it. But, but So this is outside of a more general idea of spirituality, but... Again, people start asking questions that are uh, – the other thing it forced me to do was look at it in, in, uh, in generalities, right? In general, at scale, here are the problems. You know, and people are like, well, I mean, like what if it's right next door to you? Well, I'm like, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
It's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the story for the whole thing at scale, mm -hmm. right? Anyway, um, yeah. So I kind of sit with these. What's what's been great about exploring this stuff with Marty and the UFO stuff, and then also all the other things we've looked at with the podcast in terms of my spirituality is it's done the same kind of thing that Egypt did. Is it kind of stripped away all the bullshit, and now I have like. I have, I'm like, I'm able to point and say, here's the only thing I can point to and say, that is right. <laughs> or that, this is what I think is true. And that is that there's something more. Yeah. I don't know any more than that. And that's good. That's a good thing that it's been pared down to this bear that I can look at this and say, I know that there's more mystery here. And maybe there are ways that I can inquire into the mystery that will give me more understanding that I don't do, like meditation, like some of the stuff that Heather does. Possibly there are avenues for me to gain more understanding or to at least explore it more that I haven't done. But in general, getting rid of all the, the BS so that I'm able to be at that point is really good, I think. It's been, it's, it's in, and it's, it's uh, liberating. Yeah, yeah. You know, so on the one hand, it leaves you with who am I really? But on the other hand, that's it's a freeing thing to like, I feel like it's a freeing thing to be to be able to sit there and say, OK, I don't know. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. It's not bad. It's 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 only that I got I got to that point and I'm kind of and then I just sort of left it there. But now I'm I'm doing that's more good. Of, yeah, I left it there, but now I'm doing more of like thinking about sort of like taking all this stuff in and rethinking, you know, uh, about possibilities, which to yeah. me is an exciting and fun thing to do. Yeah. Is to think about possibilities and yeah. like what makes the most sense or what resonates with me. So, yeah, uh, I've been enjoying that. Yeah. And I think that in general, I, I hope in general that that's sort of what this show is, is like kind of asking those kind of questions yeah. like what you know here's what here's information we've got let's kind of sift through it make fun of some things you know uh crack some dumb jokes and also in the end hopefully come to us like well here's the stuff that's the most interesting that seems to have the most possibility or resonates better with us or whatever yeah you know that's healthy and it's fun uh I don't know if it it'll ever lead to like a spiritual awakening but it no. could none of it explains the bananas or the fish <laughs> raining down from the sky. Or, yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking, I was like, where do I stand on the 411 stuff? I, yeah, fish raining from the sky. The four. I feel like we could connect these things somehow. <laughs> bananas, fish raining from the sky, and missing 411 are somehow connected. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I could totally see that. I could totally see that. <laughs> Whatever removed the fish from their previous place where they that they occupied could be the same thing that causes missing four one one. Yeah, it's possible that people will rain from the sky yeah. at some point. <laughs> God, <laughs> it's a terrible joke. Okay, uh, we have more to say, uh, so we're gonna. I think we should. We can continue it with Patreon. Yeah, yeah, we already did. Yeah, we talked about a whole bunch of stuff. We cut it up. We were like, they can't hear that. <laughs> they, we can't say this on air. So we cut it out of the show. No, that's not true. <laughs> but yeah, we had a long discussion. We're going we're gonna to put it in a Patreon episode. Uh, so yeah, 301 episodes. Thank you guys so much. We did really it. appreciate it. Yeah, we did it. No, it's, it's, it's 300 episodes. 301th one-th <laughs> episode is the 300th episode. <laughs> episode 301 the 300 and episode. uh yeah we um much appreciation to all of you for for uh being there with us through all this and being a part of it it's uh it's been an amazing journey and i just never imagined it would be what it is yeah and the fact that it is what it is is so awesome so thank you all very much for that. Yeah, thank you guys. And I, I'll say this now too, since this is uh, episode 301. For episode 201, we did a kind of a... We played a bunch of clips from older shows 
that had been collected by listeners in the Discord. They had a whole thing where they were collecting these. We didn't do that for this episode. But if... I'll just say this to you guys in the Discord and anybody else. If you're interested in that kind of thing for 401, that would be fun. You can start collecting clips and putting it together. You have 100 episodes <laughs> to work on it. <laughs> but it's a lot of work. So, you know, you guys, if you want, start planning it now. Because I've seen people asking, like, can we do this for 401? Can we do another one of these? Like, yeah, I'm totally fine with it. The thing was is that that was almost entirely... Uh, done by listeners of the show and we got a big selection of clips and then we played them and talked about them and had a good time. If you guys want to do that again, I'm totally down for 401. So just letting you know, yeah. Go ahead. Make it happen. (laughs) We can't do it. (laughs) And then there will be episode 502 (laughs) which will be the 500th episode (laughs) because 411 obviously is going to disappear. It's going to vanish <laughs> without it's a trace. not even going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Six minutes after we publish it, it's gone. <laughs> it had colorful socks. <laughs> we love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Oh